Gentlemen. Hi, yeah, Chris. Yes. The lovely lovely setting, isn't it? Yeah. Jinx. That's what Oscar says. Is it brown? Is it... What, this? Yeah. It's orange. Mustard. Yeah. Burnt orange. Yeah. That's what What's that, that on the front of Henry Hoover? It's a, it's a clockwork orange t-shirt. Oh, right. Yeah. You're grumpy this morning. Eh? You're grumpy this morning. I'm all right. Is he grumpy? He comes across a little bit grumpy. I know when you're grumpy and you're grumpy. I want to get home. Homesick. Homesick. Get me home. It's a bit of, bit of frost between Matty and John, I think. Is it? The bed situation, yeah. I'll tell you what, if I don't have a bed next time, I'm not coming, so you can fucking do it without me. <laughs> John broke couch last night with me. <laughs> to be fair, we're a comfortable couch. I was happy because I'm only diddy. So I were happy with couch. I t- I, in fact, I said shotgun couch because mm. it, it was like a safe bet. It was like a double for me that couch. It were a lovely couch, but it was just a little bit cold down here. Yeah, Matty played. <laughs> Matty played a blinder. Yeah. Earliest I've ever seen anybody go to bed. They didn't even say night. Half nothing. Eight. Just disappeared. Door closed as well. That's door a statement. Shut. That I heard him sliding a chest of drawers. I reckon. I heard. I think it would be out door. I'm honest with you. Next time I'm swinging. <laughs> so it's up to you. All. And there was two. There were big single beds. So there was never room. Yeah, it was advertised as two doubles, but and I got the brunt. I, I took the brunt for you, Matty. I told him to come and have it out with you, but I will be swinging next time. So it's up to you. But, but I was on couch, so I'm safe. Well, you, you're all right next time, but I'm telling you, if I'm not in a bed, I'll fucking not come, and I'll leave. <laughs> leave the whole corporation. Fuck you. <laughs> I told you, you were grumpy. Yeah. Right? You were trying to deny it a minute ago. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> Craig Bromfield last week. Oh, what a story. Uh, it seemed to have gone down really, really, really happy. Everybody enjoyed it because it was uh, it were unbelievable sitting sitting there listening to him. Because we were a bit apprehensive, weren't we, that he hadn't played? But yeah. There's no reason to be. Had so many, like, best ones and, like, that, that were outrageous. What a story. Mm. I think what comes over more than anything is what a family, uh, the club family is. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think we mentioned it uh, during the episode, but I would highly recommend getting a book we'll put i'll tell you what we'll put a link to the amazon uh, yeah. in the description of this episode uh if anybody because there's so much more and it's i think he put a tweet out the other day he's back up in the charts on the back of the podcast all right so obviously he's donating everything the underprivileged kids and what have you so you're doing your bit yeah but he's fantastic he's back up there happy days do you, do you, you know, if you're in the book charts, do you go? As, do, you, do you have a bit of a party like you're in singles charts? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get a number one? <laughs> never yeah. got, never got in them. I don't think. Yeah. So I couldn't tell you. I never had a party. <laughs> David Cottrell this week, he's been rustling some feathers. He uh, has again in on, in the social, social media. media. Enjoys, doesn't he? But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk no, about his football. His football shizzle, aren't we? Yeah, man. Yeah. You play we, with him. I play with him at Donny. Yeah. I, can't, I, I didn't know he played for so many clubs. You know. Yeah. Big money as well in terms yeah. of transfer fees. And yeah, Swansea mainly. I can remember him at. He's got Wales. a few caps for Wales. Wales career as well. It's good hearing about Bale, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what, I there's, like, there's I, a story on Bale that opened my eyes. <laughs> I like him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's gone up in my estimation. Yeah. I knew he'd be your cup of tea. Yeah. I'd like sitting in cinema with Bale. With a big bag of sweets. <laughs> I think you'd be the type that gets the straw and puts the paper in. <laughs> pea shooter. Good game, that, by the way. That's cool, weren't it? When you sat on the toilet and a, and a wet a wet tissue comes over. Soggy moggy. Yeah. Soggy boggy. <laughs> <laughs> so all of it, all of it ceiling, weren't it? <laughs> well, but. I can just see through the window at today's guest, so you know, so we best, uh, we best wrap it up. Eh? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, for, um, listening. thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting on the podcast. As always, and we've got a load... More new live show dates coming very, very soon. We have. We're not bowing to pressure. We're making this a short intro just because the guests are here, not yeah. because people are saying... It's cold out there and all. Yeah, we don't want to leave it blowing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, if we've got enough time, we'll be fucking annoying the fuck out of you as we are on the for seven, <laughs> eight, twelve minutes. Right, let's get him let's in get him then, in. shall we? Yep. George, your best middle name, I believe. You must have been... Uh, was it... A big footballing family. Yeah, my um, my dad was a massive Man United fan, and uh, he thought he'd throw George Best in my middle name. And uh, I don't know whether my mum fancied him, or it might have been that way around, or my my dad <laughs> uh, supported United. But I remember I actually got my birth certificate signed by George Best, 
I went, I went, and went to meet him and I think it was Alex at the time, his wife. And uh, he turned around and he said, um, look, another George Best. She's just turned around. She goes, oh, for fuck's sake, not another one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he signed my birth certificate. Yeah, you still got it then? Had to, you still, still got, got it? Still got it, yeah. Fuck me. Yeah, so um, it was a shock because obviously later on in life, he was an alcoholic at that time. I checked into rehab for alcohol, so... It's in the name. So, yeah, and it's in the name, yeah. <laughs> Two shiny heads there. Yeah, lads. No, oh, I've just noticed that. Glistening. Get like, them lights off. Hey, glistening like you're beautiful. We've a couple of songs <laughs> earlier, haven't we? Oh, to ask a question or try and fucking pot one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's done us that, John. <laughs> <laughs> so you all good, mate? All good. Really good. How are you guys? Yeah, we're Flying, good. Mate. Living the dream, aren't we? <laughs> Teammates? Yeah. Remember the um, stewardship? Stewardship of Sardine Saunders. <laughs> <laughs> Sardine. Do you know what? We had a really good time there. We had, um, at the time, it was a bit of a shit show what was going on, but he just managed to get good players at that level yeah. together and we managed to find a way to get promoted, didn't we? Yeah, he fucked up the championship season. Yeah. That was with the Jufi and Chimbonda, but then the next year, God. and you, you fucked that. Sign me, yeah. Sign <laughs> Rob Jones just fucking used to put that in from a men. corner. He'd, yeah, he used to say a leader of men. Another well, snooker ball. Yeah, <laughs> we had a few balls. snooker balls, didn't we? Yeah, we had a few. Keeks. Paul Keegan. Keeks, there's a few fucking bald Rack wizards floating around. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what did you... Did you score many goals that year? 11, I think. No, them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Carry on. No, no. no. What, what did you think were his best attributes as a footballer? The big man. Holding the ball up. He had great feet for a big guy. Um, I think he was good to play with. Loved it. Him and Pe you and Paint Swanner up top and Hume just off. I think Hume, we had yeah. a good... Hume came halfway through, We had through, three I or think. four that were just good. So if we had like an injury, we just we had good players for that level. But Brownie, when he was fit, he was unplayable at that level. Unplayable? unplayable? No, honestly, he was on flames, believe it or not. Jeez, injury Dave. prone, but flames. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to watch a fool of Donny. I can't honestly, see it. No, he was, he was good. No, I, 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 whenever we are knocking about and they say, well, Brownie really that shit, I had to actually stick up for him and say, no. He's actually all right. He was actually a really good player. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> he weren't a natural finisher. Well, not on the pitch you've anyway. Kind, you've been kind there. Yeah, yeah. yeah not, on a night out, he was a good finisher. <laughs> great finisher. <laughs> great Cooper. finish in a wine bar. <laughs> 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 oh, he finished a few off. Uh, but no, <laughs> that, that's the truth, that to be fair. I do actually say, no, he, was, he is a, a better football than what Everyone thinks. From. Yeah, he is definitely good feet. Cheers, lads. Yeah, really good feet. And then I, I do, a, I follow it with Red. Couldn't get me out of the team at Preston. So I always bring it back yeah. to myself at the end. Yeah, he gets down a pig or two. <laughs> <laughs> good tackler as well. Started at Bristol, eh? Yeah, started at Bristol. Um, got picked up when I was 10 years of age. Do you know what? I used to, I was a striker playing for a local team in Barry, which is Barry Bluebirds. Um, and the only time that I didn't score a goal I got actually scouted to go and play for Bristol City went over there for a two-week trial and then I think I got off a contract after like a week or something so signed there and I stayed there to the age of 16 17 um which is amazing really I was training with the first team when I was 14 15 and you know like yourselves when you're coming through professionally you've got to have that arrogance to think oh, I'm better than those blah, blah 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 and I think that's why I kind of like stood me in good stead, really. I, I was training with the first team, didn't feel that I couldn't get in the team at a young age and then just went from there. Who did you support? Who did I support? Man United. As a kid. Oh, As a so, kid, so you yeah. weren't asked about playing for Cardiff? Which, uh, Cardiff never picked me up Cardiff or asked Swansea. me to play, no. They tried signing me a few times later on in my career uh, when I was professional, but nothing ever materialised. But when I was 14, Man United wanted to sign me and I just thought it was the right thing to do because obviously it's a massive club. They've got loads of players coming through, not many of them make it. So I just thought the best football experience for me would be to stay at Bristol City to try and get in the first team as soon as possible. Yeah, it worked for me and the, the club backed me and obviously Brian Tinning gave me my debut when I was 16. He was always watching the academy. So he had always one eye on that, which is good. Experienced player going to watch the younger players develop and that was good good timer for me really. So was that in League One? In League your One, yeah. Was it your debut league game? My debut, I think it was, yeah. Um, as, big, big shout, 16-year-old, uh, it? must be yeah. one of the youngest. Is it one of the youngest I'm to play I'm second for youngest to play for Bristol. Uh, Marvin Brown was the first one. He was 16, then I was not too long after him. Yeah. And then I made my debut for Wales when I was 17. So when I look at my son, and he's 15 now, to think that 
a year obviously above him, I made my debut against fucking fully grown men yeah. and then played for Wales at 17 is quite quite mad really. Remember that, walking in that dressing room at 16 year old really to think. Yeah, shit to myself. Yeah. But even when I started training with the first team when I was 14, 15, I remember some of the players, uh, Tommy Doherty, who was a really good player um, for Bristol. And he was a great lad as well. But if I didn't pass the ball in front of his feet, he'd be like, what the fuck is this? Like, and he'd just stick it on you straight away. If things wanted, you know, I had Bradley Orr who was behind me. He was a younger guy as well, but, you know, Scouse guy, tough guy. He helped me develop my game. And if I gave cheat back, he would soon tell me about myself. And I think it just helps you develop, um, you know, just certain details of the ball got to be passed in front of you, the right tempo. And if it's not done, you get told about yourself. Yeah. You told that to Tevez, didn't you? You made that clear. Yeah. If it's not on my feet, Carlos. It's, hey, no, <laughs> Bellamy. Oh yeah, did you? Yeah. And that, but believe it or not, I never played with Carlos Tevez. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, he, he just thrown in anything. Carlos he? missed his chance. <laughs> yeah, fuck's sake. I'd have made him a fucking player. <laughs> <laughs> but Brad said that, didn't he? That he was a nightmare, probably for his other teammates because he just demanded from everybody. I don't think it's a nightmare. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Well, it's did good. you see like that then? Yeah, when he was, I don't. Know, he's a few years older than me, but I had him behind me, and I told him to fuck off for the one game. And he was raging and he came into the, the uh, dressing room. He said, you ever fucking speak to me like that again, then we're going to have problems, basically. And, um, but he just, for me, playing in front of him on the right wing when I was so young, developing, I needed someone like him on my case constantly so I didn't let my concentration down. And when I, work, I worked hard and we worked together well, I think it, it can only be better. If he's yeah. raising the bar and the levels and, and everyone else around you, I think it's, it's good that you follow suit. Would you take it that, right, I'm going to prove you wrong? Yeah, 100%. Um, and feel I, good when I you feel did. good because he, was, he wasn't just always sending, you know, negative messages out. He was always like very talkative. There's a lot of positives that would come through him, you know, well done, like blah, 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 and all that stuff. And he, he was brilliant for me. I think he's best suited for, for me at that time to, to kick me on. That's the difference in it we've talked about. It Give someone some shit, but back it up with some positive yeah, reinforcement. Yeah. Speak to them after all. the thing is, what I like about him and is that he always worked his socks off, so he was never asking you to do something that he, he couldn't do himself. Obviously, technical-wise, there might be a few things there, but he was a good player, but he always worked his nuts off, and I think that was the minimum requirements, and he's obviously a winner. He's, I think he came from Newcastle at the time. And um, he wanted to improve and he had a point to prove himself because it's a new club and stuff. So, yeah, he was always vocal and, and great for me. That's the thing as a young lad, if an older pro's giving you shit and they're lazy bastards. Yeah, you're like, fuck, you're like, fuck off, but you don't do it yourself, yeah. Man. He used to cane the young lads and he was like, not asked in training one bit. Well, just obviously lads speaking. Not as I say, not as I do. Yeah. yeah. It's all right you're saying that, but you're lazy. You have to back that. it up, yeah. yeah. Weird, he played Bab, Liverpool and that, didn't he? Mm. Fuck you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake! <laughs> young, young player of the season in your second second year is that right? Second year, yeah. Um, it was out of I think it was we had a few good youngsters that time. Cole Skews who went on to have a great career. Um, Scott Goldborn as well. We had a few good youngsters there, so to kind of get that accolade was was really really good. Um, Did you at that time when you when that accolade came? Were you like there could be some bigger clubs? Sniffing around here. A, I knew there was a few teams sniffing around. Aspirations yeah. kind of go a bit further than playing at Bristol. Yeah, I always wanted to, to kick on. I always wanted to play in the Premier League. Uh, that was always, yeah, I think that's most footballers' ambition. Yeah. If you don't set the targets high, then what's the point in fucking doing it? So when I started off there and I won that award, part of me thought, fuck, I should have been player of the year for like the whole thing rather than just like the young players. Well, no, that's with it. <laughs> nah, I think, I think, do you know what? I think just I, collecting it and said, do you that, want me to stay here for the next one? <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. I just, because I think, I think that was part of my um, issue with everything, really. I was never, ever fucking satisfied. It was like that when I was on a night out. Never satisfied when I got in at 6 a.m. I was thinking, fucking hell, the night's over already and I've stopped drinking. So it was always like kind of a thing that was I was going to say with the quality of lady that <laughs> yeah. you might Why am I starting with a yeah. 6 out of 10, man? Fuck's sake, I should have a 12 out of 10 and I've got a 6. Why have I settled for that? I know. <laughs> She's probably thinking the same as well. <laughs> fucking bald bastard. <laughs> that's a good attitude to have. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that's a, a bad attitude. I think it's, well... I think I should have won the fucking full play earlier. Yeah. I think you have to have that, don't you? And to, like, just to push you on a level, you always got to not be satisfied, just keep doing better and better. I think if you look at the best athletes who have ever done it, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, people like that, they're never satisfied with what they've achieved. Yeah, yeah. Never, never satisfied with what they've achieved. They always want bigger and better. Mm. Did you play on the Johnson? Gary Johnson? Yeah. 
he was tough. He was a tough person to play under. He was on my shit. He was on all the youngsters' shit. But I think, again, I think that was needed as well because I remember I went shopping somewhere in Cardiff and I seen a football agent or a scout and they said, oh, I'm, I'm hearing Fulham are in for you. And they were in the Premier League at the time, blah, blah. And it was in the newspapers. Are they going to think about putting a bid in for me? Blah, blah, blah. And um, so I was chatting about it. I said, oh, I don't know much too much about it. I've seen it in the papers, whatever. I went to train on the Monday morning. Gary Johnson, like, I was training. He said, you think you can get a fucking move to Fulham, play at training like this? You've got your garbage, this and that. And I think he was just test planting the seeds to say, you know, don't think you've made it too much just yet. Keep working hard. Yeah, kick up the arse. Yeah, kick up the arse. And he was always doing that with me. But I think he was, he, he played me, he trusted me, he wanted the best for me. And I think that I needed that. I think I always needed that manager just to give me a kick up the arse because otherwise I'd just get lackadaisy and just go out and get steaming or or whatever. But he, he, he was tough, but he was trying to create that environment. Because we were at Bristol City, we were the biggest club in, in that league at that time. He wanted us to get promoted. That was his job to get promotion. Yeah. And he wanted to create that winning environment that we didn't have. Big money, isn't it, for a... A young one. You what? Was it two million you went for? Two million at the time, yeah. It's fucking pocket change to people now, isn't it? Really, yeah. with the transfer fees. Yeah. 17, mate, 17. Not 19. Your research is a bit wrong there, Bugles. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Not people. <laughs> Not people. If you don't do any research, you, you can't get it we, wrong. You know what? We actually... So when I signed for um, Wigan, they we played a game on Sky and it was the last couple of days of the transfer window. So we played against Northampton away. We went down to 10 men. I think we won 2-1 or 3-1. And I, as soon as we had a player sent off, it was... At the time, I just... I don't know. I was just dribbling past one player, two player, and I was on, on fire. And I was won a penalty, then won another one, I think it was. And I took one of the penalties and I scored. And um, my agent just said, after your performance tomorrow, I think you'll secure a move uh, over the next coming days. And so I went away then with Wales on international duty. Norwich's um, chief exec came down. I actually signed for Norwich that day. Um, so the chief exec came down, met him at the hotel in Cardiff. And then when I jumped on the the Welsh team bus to go to training, blah, blah, Bristol City's chairman rang me and said, we just ex accepted a bid from Wigan, a Premier League team. You can obviously go and chat to them as well. But my agent kept the papers from Norwich to release because I think he knew a Premier League team was coming in. So Norwich Championship at the time. Yeah, no Norwich Championship at the time. And then Wigan got promoted, I think, the year before that. Yeah. Yeah, so I signed for Wigan under Paul Jewell. But Norwich were chewing. Probably, yeah. But at that time, I think... You know, Tosh, John Toshak was fucking raging. He was like, what are you doing? You should have signed for Norwich. Robert Earnshaw and Carl Robinson were in the squad as well. They were saying, you should have signed for Norwich for your development. But I just thought, you know, no disrespect for Wigan. They promoted the year before. It's not exactly I'm going to like, you know, an Arsenal or someone or mid-table like Newcastle or Everton at the time. It was kind of like a team that I felt I could get in, in there eventually. Um, and I'm 17. Everyone wants to play in the Premier League. No 17-year-old yeah. is going to turn down and move to the Premier League, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Take your yeah. Chance, yeah, take your chance and you never know. So I went there and uh, obviously things started okay and they got, you know, tough towards the end of my career there. What was it like in the in the Welsh squad? At uh, that age? At that age. It was kind of like, I think it was a bit of a fucking shit show, to be honest, because <clears throat> the environment was, with the under-21s, it was really weird. We had like a, a winning mentality where we'd go into every game thinking we could win because we had a really good under-21 squad. And then Toshak started bedding through a lot of the youngsters all at once. So it was about eight, eight or 10 of us would be under 21s playing with the first team. I think I was 16, 17 training there. Then eventually made my debut at 17. Um, but Giggs would be there, obviously. I think we sat down at the one table. I just, Giggs was my hero growing up. Obviously it's not great at the fucking present moment in time with the <laughs> papers he's getting involved with, but, and the news that's going on. But he was like my hero growing up. So to be sat there, when previous, like the year or two I just left school, it was quite fucking surreal, really. And then obviously Craig Bellamy, which his character was just, obviously he talked about tough and wanting to win every day and being the best. He would soon let you know about your shit. If you, yeah, are oh, so intense. But he was like the best trainer every day, one of the most, the best professionals I've ever come across. So he backed it up. And um, so, yeah, it was a bit crazy, but you could see that some people, some of the players didn't want to be there. It was like, it was just fucking getting in the way. I think that was because of Toshak, because it was a shambles, wasn't it? 
I don't think he was so much of him because he brought like the players through, but I think it was just a generational thing where they just used to get and beat players were just pulling out with injuries where that culture kind of changed a lot when Gary Speed came into the place. You know, if you don't want to fucking play, don't turn up. You should be proud to represent your country. Yeah. Whereas before it was just like kind of turning up. And Toshak would say to us, he used to take us to Spain quite a lot. And we'd be there, we'd have all, take our chef away with us and we'd have Chinese food and stuff and Bellamy and gigs would be like raging. Where's the fucking broccoli? Where's the pasta? Where's like the, the veg and the chicken and all this kind of stuff? <laughs> would not be your watch, John, would it? Would you? <laughs> and Tosh, I could be like, Craig, <laughs> Ryan, shut the fuck <laughs> up. Yeah, he'd be like, fuck, I Passes want this shit. Rib. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd be having Chinese food and, and Tosh, I would turn around and goes, no fucker wants to be here anyway. So might as well just let them eat what they want and drink what they want. So it's the just kind like, of, yeah, of it. just accepting of like, you know, most people People don't want to be here. You know, food makes you happy. So let's put nice food <laughs> offerings and make you happy. <laughs> we're just, we're food just, makes you happy. We'll just butter them up with yeah. chicken and black bean. Eh? So, <laughs> so it was crazy, yeah. And we had Roy Evans as well, who was obviously manager of Liverpool. He was the assistant manager. We had Dean Saunders as well there as a coach. So we had people at the highest level. Toshak obviously managed Real Madrid. And we're just eating there fucking with Chinese food. And some of the training stuff we would do would be like, wow. What, your sessions? We're, yeah, some of the sessions would just be like, wow. And it was just like quite old fashioned, but... He, he's the one who started the whole thing of bringing the youngsters through. So he obviously seen something there and, and he knew for, he was, he was, he's a clever guy because he said, look, you might not, we might not qualify for something in my time as manager, but we're starting to put the, the proper foundations in there for the next few managers over the coming years. And obviously that's, that's happened. You think Tosh Hack just thought a little bit, I tell you what, the young lads, they'll just turn up every, every time. So mm. fuck it, I'll just put them in. I think yeah. eventually, yeah, because the youngster were coming through and they were better than what was already there. Mm. Um, you know, obviously Aaron Ramsey and people like that were coming through. Bale was, you know, <laughs> next level. So we were coming through and we were ready to take the places of the, of the other ones who didn't want to be there. He's, well, he's took that mantra, hasn't he, of wanting to play for Wales, like preferring to play for Wales than anybody else. Yeah. Right. Think, he? Bale. Yeah. I, yeah, he has. He's, Wales, massive, he's golf, massively proud Madrid. of it. I think when you have that figure who's playing for Real Madrid or he's like a, a superstar... That then filters down to the youngsters. Yeah. Whereas when I was there, for example, if you've got gigs pulling out of the squads and he's your best player, everyone's like, oh, fucking hell. Yeah. If our best player's turning out. And I wonder how much of that was Ferguson. Just saying, I just probably a lot. You know, a lot. When, you think, of, right, when yeah. you think about how long he played for and he played ridiculous amounts of games, to only have like 67 to 70 caps for Wales is it's madness, really. That proves how much he's, he's pulled out. Would Bellamy not have something to say for the lads pulling out? <clears throat> I'm I guessing he would, he would never pull out for... No, he never pulled out for anything. He was always proud to be there. And I think he probably did. I don't think I hit, like heard anything, but, you know, he'd be really fucking annoyed. But he would... I think he probably had that mentality, fuck it, I'm on the pitch, we've got a chance of winning. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a unique fella, isn't he? Yeah, he's, I loved him. Do you know what? <laughs> I remember, right, we were playing... Um, we used to go away, play Pro Evo or FIFA at the time. It'd be me, uh, Andrew Crofts, Craig Morgan, Craig Morgan and uh, Bellas, we used to go in the hotel room, winner stays on, blah, blah. And one that used to lose, you have to pull your pants down and show the hard, like, hard sliders you got on now. You have to do a, um, a press up. And when you come up, you have to hit them across the arts with a slider full force. So the lose you stuff like, 10 fucking slaps off per person. I remember hitting Bellamy and a couple of the boys like saying, fucking, like Craig Morgan hit him so hard this one time. He went, oh, I'll fucking rip your head off. <laughs> and you just see him just melted. The next one was like a little tap because he just wimped out of it. I think it's actually chance in it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually chance it off. It, yeah. Yeah. Free just ticket. Gone. Fuck off. The one slap, I just thought, fucking have that for shouting at me in training. <laughs> He's a big fucker as well, Morgan, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He's his unit. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, he was class. He was just so professional like every day just on it and there's nothing you could say to him and if he gave it to you that would be it um but i think it was a difference we played with because in the time when i was in the welsh squad we had bellamy and Giggs who were fucking flying the prem and then we'd literally no disrespect but we'd have like someone who's playing for tns who is not even obviously in the welsh prem so they're not even in league two and they'd be playing with these players I remember the one time one player hooked it down the side in a five aside and it went out of play and Bella's just turned around to Tosh. I don't want to fucking see that guy in this squad again. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't see him in the squad again. again. <laughs> we didn't see him. <laughs> but that's, it, what, that, that's what he's like. He, he wouldn't have thought that poor kid. Yeah. He only played play for TNS. He's been caught up to a Welsh squad. He wouldn't have thought he's just not very good. He'd have gone in with, fuck, 
he's never yeah. fucking coming in again. Yeah. Because that was his winning mentality. Yeah. Kind of like, right, we need to do everything in our yeah. power to win. And he wanted to do things the right way. So he wouldn't want to hit, hurt anyone's feelings, but in the same time, you probably would have thought, fuck it, because we want to win. You don't get to that level without wanting to have that. What were Bella's like? I mean, were Norm, Mark Crossley in the Welsh squad back then? No, um, I think he left just before I got in there. So obviously Norm spoke about quite a big drinking culture, mm. you know, when the lads were uh, on international duty. Yeah. <laughs> Arts and with the Chinese in the, in the yeah. room and all that. What were Bella's like with that? <sighs> he wouldn't have liked it. I didn't... Was there still a drinking culture? It was still a drinking culture, yeah. It's probably, we had a good fucking drinking culture, even still to when I retired. Um, after every game, it was always like a piss up. If not, even through the week in, in training, you know, a few of us would be sneaking out because it'd be a long, intense fucking week, two weeks, we'd sneak out, go for a couple of drinks or whatever, and then sneak back. And Toshak would actually catch us a few times. He'd be like, oh, you bugger. Cause he, cause we'd be, <laughs> oh, you yeah. bugger. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> bugger. <laughs> cheeky I'm, buggers. I'm, I remember this, right? <laughs> fucking, I was, I was walking in the hotel early in the, um, the one following morning, he drove past me in his um, Mercedes and he just put the window down. He goes, Cotch your bugger, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> He's called everyone buggers. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm, if I'm, I'm only getting a bugger for sneaking out, you're out, you're out, you're out, aren't you? I've been out, Gaffer. I know, honestly. You old cheeky little it. bugger. <laughs> your mince pies would be all, all over the place. You'd be like, fucking hell. And then we'd go on the training pitch. You'd be like, Roy, they've been out again. <laughs> to Roy Evans. <laughs> That's the manager of this Welsh squad. They've been out again, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking eh, Roy. Eh, <laughs> the buggers. <laughs> How did you find the step up to the Prem originally? Because you, know, you were confident <sighs> at Bristol. Do you know what? It was really tough because when I was at Bristol, I knew I was going to play all the time because I'd gotten to the team. The team was doing really, really well and whatever. And I felt like I was... Scotty Murray was moved from the right wing to the left wing and he was doing great there. He was great to be around the place and I was on the right wing for Bristol and we were playing all the time. And then when I went to Wigan, I came off the bench a couple of times and I wasn't used to being left out, if that makes sense. Even since like a young age, I was used to playing. So I, I found that kind of like knockback. I probably took it looking back quite personal when I shouldn't have really, but at such a young age, I wasn't getting the right guidance I felt. Like the managers wouldn't speak to you for leaving you out. Not that they fucking should do, but I was I was used to that. And what were you like back then? Would, would you sort of- Arrogant as you- fuck. <laughs> I was, honestly. Oh yeah. I was so arrogant, honestly. And it was just, it just didn't fucking help me. And and looking back now, I had Antonio Valencia in my position, but I didn't know who he was at the time. He's a just, quick bugger, isn't he? Yeah, he's rapid. <laughs> and at the, he was fucking about when I first went to Wigan because he was like, always oh, having niggly injuries and whatever. And Paul Jewell was on his case. And he just started flying then. And then I couldn't get in. Um, so I was on the bench a lot. And and then when I was put back into the reserves, to, even at a young age, I should have taken that thing, right, this is my time to kind of like, right, I show the manager, prove myself. But I just thought, fuck it, I want to go. Because I had John Toshak in my ear saying, if you're not playing, you're not going to be in the Welsh squad. And so- And it's a good social. Yeah, and it's mm. great social. <laughs> Fucking Chinese getting steamed all the time. And- um, and so I knew I had to get out on loan to stay stay in the fucking team. So that's what I did. I went to Sheffield United and- uh, How long was it before you went, went to Sheffield then? Before you needed to um, Probably like a year, 18 months. It's still quite You're a still long time then. 18, 19. Yeah, still, still young. I went to Sheffield United like 19, yeah. And, um, but I thought that that was the best thing for me going to Sheffield United because I went there, Speedo was there. He was guiding me, we had like amazing pros there. Gary Naismith, um, James Beatty, our car school used to be Speed, uh, Gary Speed, Gary Naismith and James Beatty over, we used to go over fucking, oh, well, that's the one, yeah, over there, we just have, we used to have a laugh, constantly. I think it's a big, it's a big, uh, it's a big thing to move to, did you move to Manchester? Yeah, uh, uh, Warrington I moved. Warrington, yeah. so at 17, it's a big upheaval, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You know, it, it, that in itself, for a 17 year old lad to move 200, 200 plus miles away. But it's as well that probably that mindset that you're on about of wanting more. Want to, I mean, there's not many 18, 19 year olds on the bench at a Premier League club that are going to be, oh, I need, I need, I need yeah. to move on. I need to move yeah. on. I need to get I think it's a good on. mentality though yeah. to have that still, that you just want to play. Yeah. You speak about that I just all the time. I want to play, yeah, and just get my experience as much as possible. And I think Sheffield United are a bigger club than Wigan and going there, f- fuck, we had a good squad. You know, like I said, Gary Speed, Brian Robson was the manager. Um, Brian Kidd was there as well at the time, who was amazing. And I just thought he's... So I was like, kind of like still looking at that from that perspective. Brian Kidd's played, uh, had all the best youngsters at United. He could maybe develop me to be better to go back to 
maybe Wigan and, and achieve great things there. But even if I got a move, and then I quickly knew after, um, actually, when I signed for Sheffield United, I think Brian Robson lasted about two or three games and he got the fucking sack. And then Kevin Blackwell came in and he was just like, yeah. pff, just like hard, like so on it. <laughs> we'll get I on to him. Fucking hell. I remember, right, we, we had a circle. When we used to have a circle of possession, he was just fucking, instead of like just putting in for people to keep possession, he was just a half volley at people, like, like here, expect you control it. And just like he was on the youngsters and whatever. But at that particular time, he came in quite hard on us, but we needed it. But I was already used to it with, you know, Paul Jewell and, and Gar uh, Gary Johnson when I've had that time. So that was fine. And next thing you know, we just started picking up and we're getting better and better and better. And we got away from the relegation zone and, and got into a, a good form then. And um, yeah, it was wicked. I love my time there. When I signed there permanently, um, Kevin Blackwell said, look, you're going to be my main right wing. I want to sign you permanently. And when I got there, he just chat, he just chat uh, fucking as a shit in my ear constantly. He was like, and they put Greg Halford there. Who was, we signed as like a right back, I think it was. Um, Were you on lawn the year that they got the playoffs then? Or was that? No, it was a signed? permanent deal then. Right. We got to the playoffs. Yeah, we got to play our final. That went out when we played yeah. them. Yeah. So he was, um, he was just constantly just like on the youngster's case. I think if he was involved as a manager today, fuck it, it wouldn't last long. He'd be getting called in by every organisation for bullying. It was just oh, like really? ridiculous. But I remember some of the youngsters he used to treat like shit. It must have not been too bad to start with because you signed for him permanent. Yeah. Oh, no. No, he was good for me. Like he was hard, but, he was tough, but I was doing well. And then one shit hit the fan, it would go against you, lose a couple of games or, or whatever else. So you just... He just thought he could do, and he, do you know what I didn't like? I didn't like that he treated, you know, Lee Hendry was fucking a top player and you could see in training, he was on fire and you can see he was probably one of the best technical players there. He just wouldn't give a chance and just treat him like shit. And I just didn't like that. There's no need to treat people like that with, mm -hmm. you know, with no respect, especially as someone who was, he was really high profile for us at the time. It was, what was your relationship with Gary Speed like? Cause obviously everything that we hear about him, especially with the young lads, um, as a mentor, I suppose. And were you being a young Welsh lad? Did he take that kind of role with you? Is yeah, that... he was class. Even when Blackwell would go against me and say certain stuff, he would always pull me to one side and say, look, don't worry, keep working hard. This is how you can kind of like overcome stuff. It'd be good for you mentally to kind of like take those challenges on. And even in the car, because we had a car school, he would always like be laughing and joking. And he was just amazing, professional, amazing person. And he was just always, always there for like to give advice to anyone. Seems like he would have had his work cut out at Sheffield United under Blackwell. I think he, he was. Giving up, yeah. shit and he was a lot of, trying to build them all back up uh, again. Yeah, he would. A lot of the players, even the senior players, would go up to him and ask him for advice. He's fucking, he's the main man. Yeah. And um, you could see that eventually he would go into coaching and managing because he was just like that. He was that good. And with that car score, he's fucking, he's hilarious. I think the one day on the car score, I think he shit himself on the, on the way over there. I think I'm <laughs> shit on that, we? <laughs> <laughs> So, but he was just glad. I think he had too much fucking Costa coffees on the way over. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, when, so when did you start with like joining with the Tuesday clubs and to going out with the lads and all that early or? Do you know what? Probably definitely Doncaster, I seen the change when I signed there. Also, it weren't as young as... No, it wasn't really, really young. I only started drinking properly when I was about 19, I think it was. I used to go out when I was like 18 and, and give her the fucking big bollocks of buying champagne. I never used to like the thing. And I used to think, I used to spend all this money on people who were not even my friends to be around me. And I wouldn't even drink the stuff. Mm. And then 19, I was drinking a little bit and more and more, but I started to drink a lot more when I was about 23, 24. And that's when it started to kick in, you know, I was, I, when I was feeling like a certain way mentally, I would like kind of drink to take away that realistic fucking behavior of what I was, I was thinking on a normal day to day. And I just think, oh, I guess steam and think, and I just used to feel a little bit better. I used to take away all my worries and that was it. Was that a Donny? How old were you at Donny? Um, 24, I think it was 24 at Donny. Uh, no, I never 24, 25. knew you were even boozing at Donny. Yeah, me and Quinny, me and Quinny um, Robbie Blake, Benno, we used to go all out through the midweek. Gary Woods, just go out, get steaming after training, whatever it might be. And if we if we had like a Wednesday off, we'd, just, we'd be going out. We had like a little pool table fucking tournaments going on, just getting absolutely steaming and then go and train the next day. No idea. No? <laughs> no? No idea. What people do, they hide behind their masks, don't they? Yeah. If, if, even at this table, if one of them's feeling mentally uh, unwell right now, no one will know because everyone's smiling mm -hmm. and laughing. Yeah. 
Am I right in saying, did you get... Did you get some death threats from Cardiff fans whilst at Sheffield Giant for scoring <laughs> a penalty? Yeah, yeah. I, I scored a penalty when the old Cardiff Stadium, Ninian Park, and I think some of the fans expected me to miss because I played for the opposite team. And uh, I scored and they would give me fucking shit all game, which I didn't understand because they never tried signing me up at that point. And if they did, I would have signed for them. Um, so yeah, I, I've got a job to do. It's like saying, if you're a painter or a builder, you don't go to a job and fucking leave some of the bricks out, do you? Because you're from a certain area. So I've got a job to do. If not, I'm going to get <laughs> dropped. So- Can you imagine? Yeah. Oh, he's from Cardiff, I mean, he, he won't score this yeah, one. Yeah, he won't score this. <laughs> That's what, do you know what? That's what they call me Did you watch? Fun. Yeah, he'll miss this. He'll miss this. He'll, he'll miss this on Cardiff or Delhi. Uh, <laughs> and do you know what? I fucking, my, my dad went, used to go into the pub and people go to him, can't believe he fucking scored against Cardiff. And my dad'd be like, well, what do you expect him to do? Ridiculous. I said and to you last night though, didn't I, about the passion around Cardiff. It is Cardiff. mad down here. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's madness. And that, do you know what? It's good though. It's good people, good people around here, like friendly people and just everyone's nice. But with the passion when it comes to sports and stuff, fuck me. And then it got even worse when I signed for Swansea because my mum and dad's house got sprayed saying, you jack bastard. Oh. So that was, that was a bit crazy. And I remember when I was, I'd be on a night out or I was going for food somewhere. I'd have people come up to me, you're a fucking, and I'd be with my kids. I'd be like, you're a fucking disgrace signing for Swansea. And I'd be like, don't speak, who the fuck do you think you are coming up to me like this in broad daylight in front of my kids. And I said to him, oh, what do you do? So I'm a painter and build, uh, painter and decorator. My mum's house needs a painting. Yeah, I know, I said, oh, yeah. give a I said, I said to him, can you go and patch my fucking thing up? But my dad's a painter, so he sorted it out. But, um, but otherwise, I would have sent him around. But I said to him, so if you get offered good money to go and work in Swansea, do you refuse the job then? Because it's in a different fucking postcode or what? And he's like, no, no. I said, well, fuck off then. Honestly. Yeah. That's how mad it is down here. They would not think twice about doing it in front of your family yeah. on an afternoon when you're just having a bit of lunch. But don't they say that as an end... Swansea fans say that as an endearing... Thing, don't they? Yeah, you they Jack say Buster. like you Jack Bass. That's what they say with their fans, don't they? And but obviously the opposite fans say you Jack Bass, or you you know sheep shaggers if it's not um, Cardiff fans and stuff. But yeah, but then it was it was bizarre because the Swansea fans and the club were just like amazing to me, so welcoming. Everyone was really friendly. Great club, great people there, and they didn't give me no abuse, even when I was playing shit. Were there any apprehension from you when Swansea came in, even though you're a United fan? Just from just because of what we've spoke about. Do you know what? My my main thing was that what we, um, John just said just now was, you know, he, he, when I moved away so young and I was like 200 plus miles away, my thought process was, well, I've got young kids. I'm back home with my parents. They can see their grandchildren growing up a little bit. I spend a little time with family because I was always so used to being away. Like when I, when I moved to Bristol when I was 17, I've moved into a house for only one or two days, got a transfer then to go to live in Manchester, Warrington area. And um, so I've always moved away and been away. So I wanted to come back home. I, I didn't really, really think it was going to be that much of shit, really, to be quite honest. Um, maybe I was just oblivious to that because I was always, always uh, moved out of Wales. But I just thought, fuck it, just get back home. Swansea are playing attractive football. They're looking to get promoted. So that was my mentality to go there, do a job, get promoted with Swansea and be close to my family. And it's some Derby like, isn't it? Oh, great Derby. How far some is Derby. it? Just 30 my miles? poor yeah, geography. Yeah, about 30 miles. miles. Yeah. Mm. And well, as you know, on the way on the motorways and stuff, the police are fucking escorts. They're cornering every fucking bit of motorway off on the turnings and stuff. It's, it's crazy. Perfect time to do a, a bank robbery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they've, got, they've got like 80% 80, 80 of the Welsh police force in there. Cardiff or Swansea yeah. that day or on route. So if you're ever thinking about doing a bank job, yeah, just go and do it. A couple it. of lads listening to this, day. he's not he's wrong, he's not wrong is he? <laughs> Throw the plans, Jeff. Three o'clock on Derby Day. Honestly, you can yeah. fucking nick out. <laughs> Just have a quick minute, gents, for a message from one of our sponsors for this week's episode, NordVPN. My I'm favourite VPN service. We've got another uh, story of a satisfied customer yeah, as well, haven't we? Well, yeah, one of Matty's yeah. mates. What was it? Was he Spain? I believe he was telling us. They were in Viva España. And he wanted to watch a three o'clock game, I believe. No, it was no, just it was Sky. Sky. Normal Sky Go. He wanted to watch his Sky Go while on holiday. He wanted to watch a match. Couldn't watch it. Oh, I remember. No, no VPN. Signed up with a code Kosh. He bounced it, didn't he? I know that's your normal Bounced your his location back to the UK. All of a sudden, he's watching match. Feet up with a San Miguel. No brainer, innit? it? Oh, that... Especially with the offer. And I wouldn't have even thought, if I go abroad and I can't get Sky Go to work within 10 seconds, 
I'm go, I'm put my phone down or whatever and go on the bar. And yeah, put wandering line around, it. wandering around looking for that chalkboard. Yeah, with that chalk. No, I've not got it. Not got it on. Keep walking. Keep walking. Excellent. Yeah, and obviously that, that that's not the only benefits. There's the the um, military military style security for all your passwords, your bank details, all the information you don't want people to know. You can have that lock and key tightened away. Nobody's getting the dirty mitts on it. And I think it goes without saying, we have got an offer, haven't we, Chris? Oh, it does go without. We're not going to carry on without saying it, are we? <laughs> because if you go to www.nordvpn.com slash kosh, get this, four months free. No way. Yep. That's pick your, jo- the pick your jaws up. Four months free, plus 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't like it. Outstanding. I, I don't I, think we exactly. need to say anything else. <laughs> I, I, I am honestly speechless at that. Yeah. Well, should we leave it at that then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you fit straight in in the Swan uh, Swansea dressing room like with the lads? Yeah, the lads were great. They were amazing. Um, it must have helped knowing a few of them from the Welsh squad. And yeah, it was. And, and Nathan Dyer, I was there at Sheffield United with, and I always I knew him from like the academy days when he used to play for Southampton. So we, I had a good relationship with him. And um, a few of the other Welsh boys helped me settle in, Ashley Williams and, and Joe Allen and people like that. And there was loads of foreigners there, though. A lot of Spanish p- uh, players, and which obviously was brought in by Martinez and uh, Paulo Souza. Yeah. Which is good, but they were all, like, amazing, friendly people, good players. Like, everything about the club was great. The people behind the scenes. Um, we had a kit lady who was brilliant, made everyone feel Susan. welcome. Yeah. She was amazing. We've heard about Susan, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> She's class. And Leon, um, yeah. Leon, Leon Knight spoke about Susan. Really? Yeah. Not in a, Not in a good way. class way, no. Oh, wow. I think the term was, fuck you, Susan. Oh, wow. What did he say? Yeah. Did, he, did he feel like she stitched him up or yeah. something? I think got... it might have been more Leon's fault than Susan's. You you? <laughs> we'll have to wait. <laughs> I don't know this story, but uh, for me, <laughs> she was... Susan, Susan she was lovely. She was, she was great, yeah. Everyone, everyone liked her. She, and... Yeah, she was great. She made everyone feel welcome and so on. I don't know what her relationships were like with the manager. Maybe she might have gone to speak to him, but for my experience, she was great. I think that that was his point. One that the reason he left was because of her. He sti- she okay, stitched him up or whatever. But I bet she were a lovely lady, Susan. She always nice in tunnel. I yeah. Her in tunnel. Oh, re- always Tall, really nice. Blonde, long, blondish. Yeah, hair. yeah, yeah. Really nice. Mm. But there were a lot of Spanish lads there. But it, it would have been all right for Brendan because he's he can speak good Spanish. Yeah, he speaks the lingo, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he came in doing all this fucking lingo and all that kind <laughs> of stuff. And uh, do you know what I remember though? Fuck me, we were in the showers and we used to where we were with Swansea. It's not like their training facilities they got now because we were building still up. We were still washing our own kit when I was there, and we were in the championship. What was Susan doing? <laughs> but I think she had a, I think she had a cigar on with Leon somewhere. <laughs> but, <laughs> But she, yeah, so that's when, we only started, uh, they started washing our kit when Brendan came in. She's like saying, yeah, championship level and one of the best teams looking for promotion. They're driving their own, uh, washing their own yeah. kit. So. Susan was furious. Yeah, she was fuming. Fuck you, Brendan. Yeah, she's like, fuck's sake. <laughs> Brendan, you won the deal. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, and I remember the time with the Spanish players and their class and uh, we had to share the facilities with like a fucking leisure center, you know? So we'd go in there, to, have shout, you'd be having, you know, your dick would be out and you're chatting to a fucking fan about how you're going to play on the weekend. <laughs> like, yeah, fucking hell, great. Or you get hammered, you're fucking shit on the weekend, when you? Your wood's flying everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. It was like that. Yeah, it's like, what's his eye? You were fucking crap last year. Like, oh, no. So, make me a finish fucking cleaning your galley, will you? <laughs> but you know what? The one time we were in the showers and Paolo Souza was talking to me and Andrea Orlandi at the time. And he started showing us these stretches. So we'd lay on the floor in the showers, bollock naked, ha- his hairiest man alive, stretching like this on the floor. You're thinking, fucking hell. <laughs> Ball so sack blind. everywhere. And you're just like, yeah, you just thought, this is how you should stretch. This is why I used to do it into Milan. We're like, yeah, fucking hell. Nice one. <laughs> You've got Geffen walking yeah. past. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just finished his spin class. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's our manager. Know, yeah. <laughs> he probably did. Fucking hell. Finished his spin <laughs> class. Honestly. <laughs> Oh, you need to clean that power Even if you wanted to show someone a, a stretch and you're, you're in showers, don't naked, do that. Yeah. You think, 
a fuck, and then you like, I'll show them after. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> there is a time and a place, isn't there? Yeah. And then you put it on your back. <laughs> I know, and then you get out and you put hair dryer on. He had fucking great hair, none like mine and yours. But he jump out and he fucking hair dryer right on his balls like this. She's like, all right, gaffer, <laughs> I'm born in the wind. <laughs> Hell, like a windsock <laughs> in a leisure centre. Oh, I know, in, in a leisure centre, yeah. But even if you are t- talking about the stretches, you're being told about it. You're not. You're not thinking about the stretches oh, that he's telling you about. Like, you're like, oh, Tracy, oh. you're looking at his area. You look. <laughs> you look at the stretches. You're looking at his area. <laughs> so, yeah, that is stretching that Paolo. Oh, Fucking gaping. It's unbelievable, honestly. <laughs> Do you know what? He used to join in in training though. Fucking hell, he was unbelievable. He was just, he would predict, predict where you'd pass the ball even before you knew you were passing the ball. You'd say, look at the balls, look at the eyes, whatever. And he'd just guess all the time. He'd fucking megs in people in training. He's insane. Is that in that didn't last very long somewhere? Was a Q, did he go to QBR? He did, yeah, didn't last about QBR, a week or long did he? Or Leicester or something. Was it Leicester? Yeah, it might have been Leicester. Yeah. Was he good? He was good, yeah. He was like, he knew what he was talking about, but I think... Um, I don't think everyone just bought into his plans and how his culture was, but he was, he was good. I liked him. How did you go with Brendan? I like Brendan. Um, his training is the best training I've ever come across. I think personally, we, I think we had a conversation was, and I think he recently said it about Damari Gray. We had a conversation where he felt that because I had things given to me so young, he felt like my hunger was not there to do better and better. Um, is that accurate, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Did he tell you that? Yeah, he told me that. He said, because he says, you say, like, with your ability, you should be, you know, playing higher up, but because your hunger's not there and and so on. But when he first came in, he was fucking brilliant with me. I played in the number 10 role. I had Scott Sinclair on the left. I had Nathan Dye on the right because he felt I could do that quite well. And we we were flying. Um, And then I missed two penalties back to back. And I didn't see the pitch ever again after that. And that was it. And it, Look, it's it's cutthroat business. I don't hold any grudge against Brendan whatsoever. The only thing that I would say is maybe hopefully it's changed now, but I was made to train with the the kids on a Saturday and things like that, which I found fucking mentally draining. That's That's not good, that, Brendan. Just on a weekend or what were you like during the week? um, During the week, I'd train with like the first team. But you know when, when someone doesn't like you, you know, like silly little things like you're getting fucking smashed in training. They don't give a foul just because it's you. They want to get you out. So they're trying to like mentally break you down to break you to get you get you out of the club. Thing is, I know what you're like. I bet your head oh, went it's fucking it. hot. Oh, my, head, my head was, trust me, veins were popping out of this bowl sweet <laughs> on a regular basis. Every day I was raging. Cute ball burns. Honestly, no fuck it, it's going everywhere. I can and, just uh, imagine him stood on the sideline going, hey, watch this to his assistant. Play on. Yeah. And then I just light the fuse. Yeah, yeah, it was just raging, yeah. I was just, I was just fucking raging. And then when I was made to train with the kids, I found that mentally draining because I just thought, you're taking the piss out of me. But the... The two penalty misses. Yeah. Like, is, was there any build-up? Like, had you been told not to take the second penalty? Or was there anything else went on? Or was mm. it just missed two? Fuck. No, yeah, it was just, no, we would always practice him in training. He was always do drills out to, to, like, you know, he'd make us run around certain poles, get the fucking adrenaline rush in, and he had obviously out of breath and so on, so be calm in those situations. And um, I just missed two penalties, yeah. And, and even though I missed one, I was always the type of character, I'm not going to stop taking penalties just because I've missed. I always just think, fucking keep going. Um, and that's what I did. And I missed the second one, didn't see the pitch again. Did he say and anything to you? I can't get me head around No, nah, he just oh. said, you know, I think when I got taken out, then it was just kind of like, well, I think you've had things too young. I think it's best you kind of like move on. I went to Portsmouth Oh, so alone. when you were saying that, then I, I, I thought you meant more... In an encouragement kind yeah, of way. So that, that. No, no. This is what you've got to do with your game. You've had things no, too no, young. No, it was kind of like the, for you to further your career and not kind of like go by the wayside. Um, it's better for you to to move on and try and find that hunger again. And um, I think I went on loan to Portsmouth and that was a bit of a shit show down there because most of the players, they were on like fucking massive contracts. There's a lot, some of the players weren't getting paid and so on. Do you know what I remember at Portsmouth? Fucking hell. We played Cardiff away and every time we played against Cardiff, I wanted to do well. And Dave Kitson was having a fucking stinker for ages, but he's one of like the best guys I've ever come across. And Steve Cottrell was the manager. But because Kitts was one of the main men, I think you might've been captain or something along those lines, but he's very, no, he wasn't captain, but he was really influential in the, in the training ground and, and so on. And so we play against Cardiff. He's had a fucking beast. And it's Steve Cottrell's coming at halftime, absolutely raging off all of us. We're shit, blah, 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 this and that. And Kitsch just stood up and he put his hand up. He said, Gaffer, I've been shit for fucking months. 
why didn't you just drop me? Take me off. Do the team a favour. <laughs> <laughs> he said, why do you keep playing me? <laughs> and, 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 and the changing room with everyone's shoulders just got like this side <laughs> laughing. We went out and we, he's fucking even worse in the second half. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, Gaffer, I'm shit. Honestly, it's like, why haven't you taken me out because ages ago? Fucking hell. With our kitsis as well, he'll have, he'll have said that really serious. Yeah, yeah. deadly serious. Like, Gaffer, why did you not just do yourself a favour? <laughs> like, no banter with it. I'm having a fucking tor torrid, take me off. He's so class. He was fucking amazing. Amazing guy. And uh, after that, we went out for, and then we had a fucking stink bomb. And then when I got back to Swansea... Um, they were playing the playoff final because they were going to get promoted to the Premier League when they got promoted to the Premier League. And I said to Brett, I rung Brendan up on the way home after my loan finished. I said, look, what's the script? Do I need to come back into training? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, I just want you out of the building. We're going for promotion and whatever. And, um, you know, I thought maybe I could have been around there, maybe watch the final and the stadium support the boys or whatever. But he just, all the lone players he didn't want around, which is fine because obviously- That's like the last three, two yeah, and a half, three weeks. Yeah, so I think that was kind of like, they're telling that he wanted me out of the building, which is fine. You already told me that anyway. And, um, which is fair enough, because maybe he didn't want the distraction of the players because they wanted to keep focus, whatever it was. And were you, were you accepting of it at the time? Or yeah, like, I just thought, said, I just being thought, a bit hot-headed, was it, did it get heated? No, it was absolutely fine. He, that was it. He, I wanted the, the boys to get promoted because they, they worked so hard. I thought, I thought they deserved to get promoted because they were probably, the, in my opinion, the best team in the league, the way they played football and the great characters they had, they all deserved it. And um, and Brendan deserved it as well, really, because his, his training is fucking unbelievable. The preparation that he puts in place is insane. And so he deserved to be in the, the best league as well. How long did you have left on your contract? I had about 18 months, two years. So oh. after that, I, and I played a certain amount of games that I should have got given a medal anyway when obviously got promoted. And um, the secretary, Jackie Rocky down there, she called me up and when I, they said, look, you, after that, you're going to get paid up, you're going to leave, whatever else. So I eventually left and she kept me a, a medal for me oh, she, she yeah, so she got me a medal she kept me a medal to to keep which was nice because everyone else fucking forgot but she didn't so that was nice of her was it better for you financially if you, if they went up or when they went up yeah it was better financially so we sort of you know got in the middle ground I wanted to leave and play so we kind of cut a deal for, for me to get that money and, then, and was and that before off. they went up uh, when they got promoted after right. they got promoted yeah Best so, time to negotiate, so, really. Best isn't it? time to negotiate, yeah. So, so it's, fucking Brendan's an arsehole and all, then, isn't he? <laughs> right, fair. He's fucking, he's an horrible bastard and all. I think, do you know what, though? I think he treated people with, he was really good with the families and he's really good with the players. I think if you're not playing, he wouldn't treat you as. You're not in his clique. Yeah, if you're not in his clique or you want singing of his hymn sheet, he'll then cut you off. It sounds quite similar to what maybe Damari Gray went through of having so much so young, then get you out. But even when he went to Liverpool, you. I think he would always make a point of taking a senior player out, wouldn't he? Of kind of like saying, right, I'm boss. This is yeah, how I'm going to do more stuff. More to make a, yeah. a statement to yeah, the rest to make of the a statement. Than... I think that's what he always did. And But in fairness to him, his, his training, the, the prep that he put in was fucking that's, incredible. We've heard that before, haven't incredible. we? Incredible. Yeah. Like, anybody who talks about Red Rock always finishes with yeah. one of the best. I will say, yeah. 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 Like his, and it, all the lads loved him and, <clears throat> and when they were playing for him. And when I was playing, I fucking absolutely loved it. Of course you do, but when you're getting taken out and then you're made to train on the weekends away from your family, then you're getting trained with the kids who are fucking are not going to be there because they're not good enough, they're going to get released and so on. So he was trying to mentally break me down. Um, I think at that particular time, I actually wanted to fucking retire after that when I left Swansea. I was like, do you know what? My fun's out of football. I fucking hate it. All I want to do is just fuck off somewhere else. This profession's not for me. Then I went to Barnsley, hated it. Border. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, now. Do you know what? I fucking... Jesus. <laughs> <Christ. laughs> I was like a fucking dagger straight in the heart. Sorry, that's not conspiracy theory. You, take, going on, is it? <laughs> you take it personally, don't you? Fucking when someone... It's the best club in England. It's not a conspiracy, it's a shit hole. You've been working with that wank, Stan Rogers. I do. Hey? I bet you don't say fuck all in these uh, pro licence badges about you know treating what? people like shit, does the, it? The people in the club were fucking brilliant. The fans were great as well. I just... I just didn't fucking like the manager or the assistant manager to be quite honest. I didn't like the fucking setup. Was he a bit like Brent? We've heard we've heard him liking to David Brent Brendan. <laughs> Have you? Yeah. <laughs> Who, was it Millsy? Yeah. Yeah. Millsy. Mm. Yeah. Is that what he said? Yeah. yeah. He was a, bit, a little bit like Brent. Just to pass your pro license, you've got to learn how to be an absolute fucking asshole with players <laughs> who won. <laughs> Fuck off, Brendan. Uh, he's not coming on. That's it. He's not, not coming on. on. No, Jackie oh, Rocky oh, sounds impressive though. Jackie Rocky, Jackie Rocky, Rocky yeah, sounds she's like the a one. Friend. I think she's retired yeah. now, but she's the one. She she was kind. She was like, oh, I'm so sad. Even when she knew 
but she didn't like the players leaving either. So when, when my time was up, she's like, I'm always sad when players are signing up their contracts. And even if it's a pay up, I'm sad to see the players go. <laughs> Sounds but like Swans, the Swans is a football club's built. The foundations are built on good women. Yeah, they are. The good, good people there. And even, you know, the, the chairman at the time, Hugh Jenkins and all the, uh, the people connected that particular time were great. Everyone, everyone behind the scenes, they built the foundations from nothing and they put great, great things in place. Um, and how were your negotiations to leave? Were they fair? Oh, they're fucking straightforward. They just had that bo the bonio, didn't they? Of uh, <laughs> millions and millions. So, so there were no issues with that. Look, no issues whatsoever. This is what I want. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Hugh Jenkins was really fair, to be fair, because he, he wanted me to sign anyway. And he, he had his eye on me for a little while being the Welsh squad. And I think I was probably maybe is signing more than Paolo Souza. I'm not too sure. And then uh, he was he was great. He was, you know, he was, he was straightforward. He knew I had a family to, to provide for and so on. And that was quite straightforward. That's fair play to you all then. So yeah. <clears throat> obviously since probably Bristol, you've been on a bit of a roller coaster of... yeah not enjoying football, mentally not being in the right place, you know, up and down, falling out of love with football. Where are you when you arrive at Donny? Because it's... Well, it's... Wait, wait, we need to get back to Barnsley first. Nah, skip Barnsley, man. Look, who was the manager at Barnsley? Shite. Keith Hill. Right. 11 games. We and, can uh, skip it. We know do you know what I didn't with. fucking like there was... I think they felt that they could scare players because... I don't know where they brought him up from the other teams that they were previously at. I think he had that power over them, kind of like, well, don't fucking bite the hand that feeds you. I've brought you to this team from like the other teams you've been at. Whereas like, I was probably, without being fucking disrespectful or big headed, but I was more well known than those, the two guys who were the in charge. The lads were from Rochdale. Yeah, and so like, I think they like kind that. of feel felt threatened. I've played it bigger with big managers and whatever else. I don't know. And then it was that kind flicker. of like, yeah. Flickcroft. Yeah. And it was just like a few comments they'd pass by and I just thought, nah, you fucking, you're both melts, you're not for me. And I probably wasn't for him. And, I, and mentally, I fucking hated it. I wasn't there. I just wanted to go to train and fuck off home and, and that was it. Um, so maybe it wasn't the club or even those guys at that particular time, but it just wasn't, I wasn't in a great place mentally because I wanted to retire. Um, and how old are you? About 24, I think. Shit. About 23, about 23 actually, about 23. Because I signed for Donny, it was like 24, 25. You want to retire at 23? Yeah, I had a fuck enough. And we all know football is like, or life in general is like a roller coaster. but there's nothing, you know, if you're playing football, you can score a 90 minute winner and then on a Tuesday you fucking miss and then you're just like up and down constantly. Yeah. And then when you left somewhere where you've not been kind of like loved, get you out the building, then you go to Barnes and you got people who are not managing the right way and saying slight, slight like remarks and stuff, the fucking belters. I just thought, fuck them. I just thought, get me out. You leave Barnsley, probably think you can't get any lower. Yeah. Then you go and sign for a team, and I'm playing up front. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when what I seen the your fuck name, have I, I don't deserve I've this. Got, You're on flames. We've fucking... just heard this. Well, I seen your hey. name up top, going from fucking Craig Bellamy to Brownie. I thought, <laughs> fucking hell, <laughs> what has my life become? Fucking <laughs> <laughs> hell. But you were flying, weren't you? Fl that first, first six months, especially. Yeah, in League One. Yeah, flying. I think. Um, and then are you feeling good in yourself? When you start, yeah, flying. because I, I had Dino there, who's the manager, and some people like liked him, some people fucking hated him, but because of the Welsh connection, because when I even used to be in the Welsh squad, and he was manager, he's like, you, you fucking should be playing in this team, because he believed in my ability, he knew I was always practicing and whatever else, and when we stay out and do free kicks and corners, be looking for Brownie and Rob Jones, the big guys or whatever, it was just I was always practicing, so they knew it'd be on the money and every time. And he just brought that belief in me. But also the lads brought that belief back in me because they believed in what I was doing. I was a good signing or whatever. And we all just clicked. Um, Do you think that were a pivotal... The, the yeah. That it was Dean Saunders was a pivotal reason in you sort of getting your love back for football. And yeah, 100%. I think his man think management, management on that front with you, like, was perfect. Yeah. He just made... Like, you'd see. Yeah. He used to mention it all the time. We've got the best, you, best player in the league. Did you need... Uh, this, and there's no shame in this... Did you need your balls tickling a bit to get yeah. the best out of you as a yeah, player? Yeah, I needed a bit of love at that time, I think, because yeah. all that fucking shit and the negative stuff, it's, if you just get, constantly get told you like negative stuff, you're going to feel shit about yourself. That's like in any walk of life. So to then have someone to put their arm around me at that particular time when I was thinking about retiring was perfect. But the lads were fucking perfect for me too because everyone just got on so well. We had good banter. We had like, we all had the, we technically, in terms of, Tactically, sorry, when we were going into the games, we weren't fucking always perfect, always great, but we all knew what we were going to do. And 
we did have the best players. We, I felt anyway at that particular time. I thought, fuck it, even if we're having a bad game, someone will bring us out the shit and we'll win. I know you said we had the best players, but a lot of the times we were second best in yeah. games. But we had John, Rob Jones and Jamie McCoon, who just had everything. And then Jonah would probably go and score a last minute winner. Yeah. And that would save us, yeah. I think fault me, we'd just it been were battered very, for 90 minutes. Very stiff back four then, weren't oh, they? Apart from Tommy Spur, left back, which he was, you know, getting up and down and he was fucking fit as anything. We were actually, and Quinny was uh, steady away, right back as well. The other, the other two were fucking head on a stick, weren't they? Mm-hmm. But great, but wicked, wicked of what you needed at that level. Great yeah. characters, knew how to fucking get promoted. Um, so yeah, it was, it was great for us. So why do you think you started boozing more at Doncaster then, if everything <laughs> else is going seemingly really well? I think probably I was going through a real difficult kind of like home period of my life where I was thinking about getting divorced and separation and things like that. I just didn't want to go home. So I was just going out, fucking getting steam with the boys. Felt like that. Wow, that was my release. Felt good. And I was just probably hiding what I felt like. Um, and I think I've always had that. Even when I when I talked about earlier, I've, I've always wanted to do better and things. I remember even when I was a teenager of like 13, 14, if things weren't going the right way, I just smashed my studs against my shins because I always wanted better. And I, that's kind of like, well, self-harming really. But looking back, when I was there at the time, I thought, Oh, you, I just want to be perfect. I want to be perfect. Is that why you got the tattoos? <clears throat> yeah, it's kept the scars. Yeah, but, it's kept <laughs> but that's why. And I just thought, well, if anyone questions me, because I'm always getting kicked on the football pitch, it's normal tackles. Anyway, always, every player's got scars. So I didn't, that was it. And so then those thoughts started coming back to me at that age again of, of you know, those thoughts of not, I was happy on the pitch, but not happy off it. And I was going to train and I was like, yeah, happy to be there and, and we're getting promoted and we're doing this and doing that. But I just want to get fucking steaming all the time as well. I know it's the difference. <clears throat> the year that we got promoted, you were flying, mm. but I, you weren't yourself the season after. No. I, I mean, probably on the pitch and off it. Yeah. I noticed, I, was, I noticed the difference with you. I was just like not there. I just, I wasn't happy. And like, was really, the changes at home in that time? Yeah, my, my children moved back to Cardiff. So I was up in Doncaster on my own. And I was going through a divorce and it was a messy divorce. And, you know, I wasn't able to see my kids and all that usual shit that women use the power against guys of not seeing their kids, blah, blah, blah. So I was having to deal with that. I remember this one time I drove down from Leeds, I think Leeds or Doncaster way, all the way, I got a three hour journey down to Cardiff and I got stopped seeing my kids. So I had to turn back around and then go back into training or play a game to then mentally prepare. So you have another challenge off it, but then you have that expectation of the fans to keep the form mm. on the pitch. I think that's the thing that Which is obviously tough. fans don't see and probably don't understand a lot of times. Mm. But you're still, a, you're still a human being who's yeah. got shit going on at all. Yeah. And, and <clears> even though you've got to try and perform on a Saturday, there's times when it's just your fucking head's not in it. Yeah. Did you speak to Dickov about it? Did he help you? <clears throat> Dickoff was, um, he was class. I loved him as well. He was, he's a good guy. I still speak to him now. And he's, um, at that particular time, I think I was in and out of the team and it was like, that was fucking frustrating. And especially because the previous year when we got promoted or whatever it was, I was probably one of the main men there and, and so on. And then to have a manager come in again, like take you out for whatever fucking reasons. And then the team was still doing shit. It was just kind of like, well, you know, and, you know, you speak to managers, but they don't always say the truth. So they just they just fucking say what you want to hear. That oh, don't worry, keep with it. You're gonna get back in, blah blah, blah and just brush under the carpet. But yeah, not what well. you needed to hear. Yeah, I think, think as well though, <clears throat> from a player's point of view, it can be seen as a weakness. If you go on, go to the dick of and tell them how you really felt, yeah, probably would have been the best thing to do. But it's hard, and it? Oh, it was hard back then. There was so, no there was no way when I was playing ever would I speak to a manager to say, look, I'm mentally struggling because one, I'm not going to jeopardize a new contract of putting food on a table for my kids and fucking, and I'm not going to be getting taken out of the team of, of speaking that because you could ask many, many managers out there now, if a player come up to you and mentally said, all oh, right, they're struggling, they would take you out of the team. But ultimately that's where I felt free when I was playing. That's the mm-hmm. only time I felt free in training, whatever, usual thoughts to come in but when I was playing on a Saturday or a Tuesday that's, that's, time, that's, the, that's my escape the only time I felt free was playing so when that was taken away from me you want to jeopardise that it was like yeah and I didn't I wouldn't jeopardise it and, and that's why I find it so hard for players to even speak now because how many managers hand, uh, hand on their heart would stick with that player to play them yeah. they all would say oh you can come to me mentally and talk about ever but I fucking doubt it most of them chat shit mm-hmm. one of the best th- stories I've heard on that front was Keith Teresa with Sean Dyche yeah, yeah. Keith was was struggling on the drink and Sean Dyche personally took a liking to him and 
help them rather than just doing what managers normally do. As much yeah. as a footballer, he's a drinker. It? Yeah, he's a bad influence. Get him out, but he, yeah. he helped them. I think that was my. That's what happened with me at Birmingham. Like when I was at Birmingham, I'd be fucking partying with the chief execs and stuff on the night out. He'd be coming over, handing me shots. I'd be fucking giving him a, bo- a bottle of vodka to have a little shot out of there and whatever else. Go fine when you're winning. When you were losing, I was still going out. I I used to go out fucking win, lose or draw. To be honest, it was never like I oh, just win to go out, to go out, and then go into train on the Monday and be like get that mentality. Uh, the rumors going around about oh, you, you fucking loves a night out. That guy, blah blah. One teams wanted to sign me. They speak to my agent, say, good player, just loves a fucking night out would be a nightmare. And so towards the back end of my Birmingham career. That's where I felt no one helped me with my addiction with drinking. It was kind of like, okay, fuck him off. Let's get him to, so, to be someone else's problem. I think at football clubs, that's what they do. They don't personally want to take and, and help those players. They just think he's too much hassle. Fuck him off. Let's get someone else in. Mm-hmm. For a bit more context, we got relegated that year, didn't we, at Donny? Yeah. And there was, was it me, you and Duffy? Yeah. We all left. We all left, yeah. Because it was either, it was a clause, one that we could leave on a free. Mm. So you went, did you and Duffy go to Birmingham? We both went to Birmingham. Yeah, Duffy actually signed at Birmingham before me and then I signed after him. And had you been offered a new contract, Donny? Yeah, but it wasn't. I, I got offered more money at Birmingham and closer to my fam, uh, my kids because yeah, the yeah. trek from fucking Donny to Cardiff is a nightmare. So I was thinking, right, Birmingham, close to my kids. Good club, big club. And that's what, you know, I, I always want, for some reason, I always want to play for Birmingham. So I, I signed there. You did you well there, didn't you? You know, on the, sorry, you know, just on the, going back to the Doncaster, you know, on the, you were in the team, you were out of the team. Do you think that would be cost? Your performance because you were out? Yeah, um, I think it was probably a bit of both. It's probably a thing, oh, fuck it, I'm going out. But ultimately, when you're on that pitch, you have to do a job. If you're not playing well, then you get taken out. So, you know, that he probably was it was justified of him taking me out on a few occasions because I wasn't playing well enough. But I, then, I remember just being in the changing room and just... You just had nothing there, mm. as if you were just. That's what I fucking felt like. <laughs> yeah, that's what I remember thinking. I felt, dr- I felt like, I felt drained. I think going from that at such a young age of like a divorce, not seeing your children, and and all those impacts and things like that, I just, I just felt fucking tired of it all, to be honest. And I, it's quite bizarre because the previous year I was loving life, even though I was still going through the divorce or, or problem, not no, a few problems. It wasn't the divorce at that time, and then um, we got promoted. I, I loved it, but then after that, I just thought, fuck, I just fucked. And the season before, think- pair that with Saunders putting an arm around you and telling yeah. you you're the best player in the league. It can only help you, can't it? And yeah, and then stops- when he left and he said he was going to take me to Wolves, he still tells me to this day, oh, can I sign you for Wolves? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck off, Dino. And, and uh, do you know what? We played a, not the Masters football, but we played some sort of indoor football tournament about three, four years. No, it had been longer, about four or five years oh. ago. And... Um, me and Simon Church, we're walking through the airport. We see Dino at like six or six thirty in the morning with his fucking prosecco like this, just on it. <laughs> he comes up to me and Church. He's like, "Church, I signed, try signing you for Wolves as well." I said, "You fucking lying. You said that to me as well." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's getting steaming on the way there, and we're playing this indoor football thing, and it was on it was on Sky. We're playing against Perez and God knows what, and it was Wales against like rest of the world, Ireland and Scotland. Blah blah. blah. We're getting absolutely fucking steaming, having shots of uh, tequila before we go out and live on on Sky and things. <laughs> madness but he was funny manager one man. he's funny as fuck do you remember when uh i think it was before the worst the best trainer where he'd bring in like tvs and stuff he's like there you go best trainer take your tv home to your family <laughs> then he bring a horse in as well the one day very rarely worked on the tvs oh i know yeah <laughs> <laughs> he brought a horse in the one day best oh, trainer. Yeah. fucking hell yeah. it was the pool queue with the, in the meetings and that one <laughs> the pool queue yeah. instead of like the board you'd get like the the f- on the projector screens of like, you know, the fucking laser the laser stuff, pen, the lasers, yeah. the laser pens. You'd be like that with a pool cue. There's Brownie up front, gonna miss again. <laughs> there, was, there was just chalk. It, obviously when the screen goes off, there was just blue chalk everywhere. <laughs> <when he's> just <laughs> it, it, it got used in the meantime. Yeah, so yeah. if there was a player he wanted to highlight, yeah. you know, normally managers have them pens. pens it's yeah. easy to see, he just goes like that, whoosh. There we go. Pool Bosh. cue. Him. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> we, there was a Reese one at oh. speed fucked up and he just, Pool Q came out, whop, off the thing. He went, Adam, who was the <laughs> analyst, write his name down and put a line through it. He'll, <laughs> he'll never play for this club. <laughs> Pool Q down. He used to, he used to hold it like a super yeah, player yeah, as well. Your... Ready, ready for oh, his next shot. Fun. And then it would just come out. <laughs> he's staring on him. Like he's clapping. He's fucking... I can just take... imagine somebody coming in on lawn or something from a bigger, big club and, and then they've got 
Dean Saunders with a pill can. Oh, fuck it. Just as his, his pointing shot. Dick all over the yeah. wall. What <laughs> the fuck's going on he's here? He's hysterical. Do you know what, though? He's Because he was obviously, he's played at a fucking wicked level as well. I mean, he's obviously a well known guy. We play against other teams. Like, who the fuck are you? Shut your mouth. You don't know who I am. And they're giving all like the big ones to the other managers. <laughs> <laughs> fucking loose cannon. Great guy. When you said you used to you go out, win, lose, or draw, would yeah. you go out? Because, you know, some lads say that, oh, I'd only go out when we won or whatever. Would you go out more if you lost? Just whenever, really. I'm just saying if you're compensating. I think I would, um, no, it didn't make a difference. If, 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 if I was winning with a team, I'd think, fuck it, let's go out. Like, that was just inevitable. But then when, um, yeah, even if we were losing, I'd try and keep a little bit more low-key and maybe not go to clubs. I'd just hit, like, bars or whatever. But then I'd have a first couple, and I'd think, fuck yeah, let's go to a club. So it, it always ended badly, really. Um, of me just steaming and what sort of drunk were you I, there was no no in between I was a, either really really happy or I was a fucking absolute arsehole so it was never like just mellow all nice just you know just like going home being chilled I was always chasing in the night being a fucking arsehole jumping over taxi car taxi drivers cars or I'd be like abusing a taxi driver trying to get me thrown out on the motorway I was fucking weirdo when I was drinking when was it when you thought I've got a problem here I think when, um, especially when I was at Birmingham, it was later on, I used to just get in all sorts of arguments, have blackouts on my kitchen floor, trying to stab myself, all that kind of shit. Okay. And, um, but then when I knew I had a problem, especially mentally, it was that I was having these thoughts when I was sober a lot more rather than when I was drinking. So then I'd go to drive to car parks, just have a little, th you know, I think to myself, look, how can I, you know, end my own life? I'd Google stuff, which is the least painful way to do it and so on. And, and blah, blah, blah. So I was having those thoughts for a little while. <clears throat> and then I was just drinking more and more. And then when I was at Birmingham, the only other time I drank on a Friday, I went to see a Justin Bieber concert, believe it or not. Fuck me. I went, <laughs> I went there and Troy Deeney's messaged me and he was like, because me and him used to go out quite a bit. And uh, he'd messaged me and he was like, um, what, are you, what are you drinking there? You're drinking apple juice. I said, oh no, I've got, I've got, yeah, I got a pint of apple juice. He said, no, you're not. Stop fucking lying. It's a pint of beer. And I said, um, he said, oh, well, you need to stop drinking because your manager's with me. And I thought he was lying. So Gary Rout was in there. He'd sent me a picture of him and Gary Rout in a box. I thought, oh, fuck it. He's seen me drinking now. I might as well get on it. So I ended up having a few more beers. And that was on a Friday. Played the next day. I think we won 4-2. I set up like two, scored one, and we won. And he said, oh, look, I'll fucking see you in the office on Monday. And he just laughed and joked about it. He said, oh, fucking behave yourself. Just watch what you're doing. But he managed me in the right way. He knew I could go out drinking, but then more often than not, I'd deliver on the pitch. That's dangerous, that though, isn't it? Mm. And it, it For everybody. Personally. Yeah. And then when I'd go into training, the physios would smell alcohol on me on some days. Like, right, have second day recovery, pretend your hamstrings, I'll have to tell the manager your hamstrings a little bit tight, keep you indoors because you can't, can't go out like that. So everybody's just helping you patch the wounds, really, aren't they? Effectively. Like, no one ever said, but, look. But probably thinking they're doing, doing your favour. Right, yeah, right. yeah, trying to look after me. They probably thought, like, the physios were great at Birmingham. They were, they were amazing. I think they probably thought they were helping me out on a personal level, not to get me into trouble. Did anybody pull you up? No one ever. No one ever said, look, you got a fucking drinking problem, but I was fucking, I was steaming all the time at Birmingham. And they it, mates, did any teammates notice or say, oh, oh. They just used to say, you love a night out or they used to think, because when you're in that culture, you're like, oh, he's a fucking loose cannon. He loves a night out. No one ever says, oh, he's an alcoholic. So they just, oh, he loves the bevy, that guy. And they probably don't know the severity of it. They no, and they know. don't see me. Mm -hmm. When I was at Birmingham, I, I was living in Windsor. I used to shoot back home to Windsor. And in the, in the end, my football was getting in the way of my drink and I couldn't wait to get back to Windsor and just go in the pub, get steaming. You're obviously just drinking to, to mask what yeah. you're feeling. Yeah, 100%. And then when I was in Cardiff, I'd go out on at 11 o'clock and um, I'd meet my friends around about 10, 11 o'clock or whatever it might be after games, go out, wouldn't get into like 6, 7 o'clock the next morning, then meet them back up on 11 o'clock on an all-day session, wouldn't get until 5.30 a.m. the next day and then drive to training, go and train with Birmingham Fucked. Absolutely paralytic, get through with it, or I get my dad to drive me to training because I was obviously not in the, the best place. And when I felt like shit, I used to drink. And I thought, if I feel like shit again, just keep the drinking going. Yeah, I was always covering up those cracks of how I was mentally feeling, but I was fucked. I just wanted to die for ages and ages. And did your mum and dad? No. No, not at that time. Um, the only time they, they found out that I even had a drinking problem was when I checked into rehab when I retired. That's the only other time because my so mum. You, you, you've, you've, you're hiding everything very well. Hiding right? everything, yeah, everything, just like like an actor, really. Does that like, just make everything worse? 
that you can't speak to anybody. Yeah, I think I think the best thing I ever did was check into rehab and talk about my problems because you, your weight's just lifting off your shoulders. I think for a long period of time, I just I was covering things that I didn't need to. Um, I just needed help really more than anything else. And then when, you know, my, it goes back to when Birmingham, when I was at Birmingham, when Zola and Redknapp was fucking about and I wasn't playing. Um, and it just, it just became a fucking circus there. It was a shit show. Like route is like really stable and we, you know, we were pro um, progressing really well. And then when Zola came in, got other agents involved and it was just a fucking shit show from the word go. And then you just like agents getting backhanders, bringing in players who couldn't fucking pass from A to B. I remember the one player we brought in, fuck me. So I came back in. So I went, I got married and, um, I went away with Wales on international breaks. So all the international players get given a little bit of extra time off when they finish, blah, blah. So that was agreed by the club. Harry Redknapp. So Zola and Rowett agreed to it. And because they changed managers so frequently at that point, they brought in Redknapp and I didn't return back to training. The club knew everything. So the first day I didn't turn back, I had an email saying, if you don't, you're late for training, you find a week's wages, blah, blah, blah. And I emailed back saying, I've got confirmation off the two managers. If you want to find me a week's wages, I'll be going to the PFA. So anyway, I come back um, a week or two weeks later after that, after my time away. And uh, the first four or five days, I was made to train on my own, completely away from the squad, not even with the first team, on my own, running around like a fucking idiot. And um, I thought, nah, I need to go and see Redknapp. So I went and knocked on his door. He's like, ah, oh, David, I was, gonna, I was just about to pull you. I said, you weren't. I, fucking, <laughs> I said, I've been here for four or five days. You fucking definitely wasn't. <laughs> so uh, he said, and he said to it's me, classic, isn't it? he said, fucking hell, I've followed your career for years and years. I tried signing you at Tottenham and Portsmouth. I thought, fuck it, another lie, because there's levels to the game. I wasn't good enough to play for Tottenham. I was a, real, <laughs> I was a realistic person. And um, so anyway, well, if I maybe didn't drink, I might have got somewhere near that time, but... And he, he was just pulling me out, he goes, oh yeah, fucking hell, blah, blah, blah. And so he's, he tried getting me out of the club, time for a change, blah, blah. And then we started playing friendly matches. And then the first league game or the cup game, I started the game, he put me straight in the start 11. And he was just, he's gone from making me train on my own to then in the first straight team. Straight in. Straight in, then fucking back out. And, but the first, when I started training with the first team, they were doing some shape for the game. And uh, I was doing some running to build up extra fitness or whatever it was because I had extra time off. And they had this centre midfield player there. Honestly, fucking terrible he was. And uh, he said, what do you think of that boy there? I said, well, there's no pressure on the ball. My mum could fucking play this. It's shadow play. He said, and he said, oh, only signed the wrong player and gave him 40 grand a week. And he walked off laughing. I thought, fuck <laughs> me. I said, no wonder the fucking club's a shithole. <laughs> fucking hell. Talk and bear in mind, before that, the players were not on nowhere near that and we're doing far better for the club and they just started bringing in these fucking pasty players and they were just pasty fucking terrible <laughs> honestly because signed the wrong player and like, started chuckling and walked off fucking hell is that it ended up <laughs> and uh, it was just crazy and then Zola when he was there we were negotiating a new deal I was negotiating a new deal with Rowett and then Zola said yeah definitely want to give you a new deal fucking being Birmingham's one of the best players for Birmingham over the last couple of seasons, whatever, you're vital to us going forward. And then in January, the, the transfer window, the last day, he gave me a few hours. He said, you need to leave. If you stay, I'm going to make your life hell. You're going to be training on your own. I thought it's definitely not coming from him because he was too nice. He's such a nice guy. And um, so anyway, if I would have stayed at Birmingham, I would have trade on my own, train at different hours, away from the team, away from my family, blah, blah, blah. I thought, fuck this, I'm not having it. And then Bristol City came in for me to go on loan. And I just said to him, I said, you're a fucking asshole because I've been negotiating a new deal for so long and now you tell me that I need to move. And I know- that's that to Zola or? Yeah, I said that to Zola, yeah. And I knew full well the players that were being brought in were fucking no better than me, for sure. See, even fucking Frank, Gianfranco Zola, he's an asshole. <laughs> he's not coming on either. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? But you know, a, a player of that level and what you think of him and- Oh, little Gianfranco. Do you know what? <laughs> oh, oh, he was still, he was come on, come on, Jim Franco. Come do you know what? He was still a fucking. He was. Um, he was. Do you know what? He was. He was a nice guy. I, I liked him, and I just think from the powers above, he was getting told what to do. And I just thought, if you're a manager, you should be a, a person about your principles. Of you should be able to pick that team. And even when Steve, Cot I went to B a Bristol City. Steve Cottrell. I fucking. I, I find him hilarious. He's a wicked guy. He's always been great for me and whatever else. And he'd be putting me in the team at Birmingham 
and I've he's told me later when he left the Birmingham job, he said his, he'd named the team on, on the board and he'd be getting told above to take those four or five players off the team sheet. Who and will that be from? Probably the fucking, well, the owners or... And who was the owners then? I don't know. I, we never met the owners or the chief exec or people from above would be telling them, look, you need to change those players to play the players that they brought in because I think Darren Dean, I think his name is, David Dean's son, who's the agent, he was bringing all his players in, getting paid an absolute fucking fortune. There was, there was, the players were no good for the change rooms, no good for the, they were no better than the players we had there. And so the, the manager was not even picking the team. And so I think the same thing was happening to Zola as well. This is like, like what do you do as a manager? What does Cottrell do? Does he say, tell you what, fuck this, right? I I'm not having this. And you're out of work. Or do you yeah. go, all right, fair enough, I'll just, put mm. Joe Bloggs and, and his fucking well, You've just got to go in. with it, haven't you? And but then you what, get, the, you so get what, sacked eventually, it's, the inevitable happens and you get a pay up and you, everybody's just playing the, and the I game. I think that's where he, he helped me really because he was like saying, look, you know, I've been told from above that, you know, you're not, your future's not here, blah, blah, blah. I'll get you a pay up and then you can leave. And, and to be fair, he looked after me. He was always respectful to me. He never took me and made me train on my own or whatever. He was, he was great. He was, he's a good person. I got a lot of respect for him. He's always, you know, just being straight up with me. Mm. So like, you know, football fans listening must be like thinking, fucking hell, is this happening at my club? And has it ended up like that? Are you paying your wa paying your, your wages to go and buy a season ticket and watch football and there's shit like that going off. The manager signing the wrong player mm. on forty bags a week. Yeah, it's fucking it's bonkers, isn't it? Really, but it's happening at every club. It's all like most clubs. It's all about politics, isn't it? Is your face don't fit, or it's got certain agents who are represent if the, a certain agent represents a manager. He's like, oh, can you bring my player in? I give you a little cut or whatever I might be going on. So that's the way it works. Mm. It's like it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. And it, as soon as mass amounts of money are involved, it just rips the soul out of it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Because that's the only thing that anybody's thinking about is that money circulating. Bring back the days of naked stretching in a shower. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Being part of that. Yeah. Gets hairy balls on a hair <laughs> yeah. Wish some fucker assigned me as the wrong player. Fucking uh, hell. me. Fuck me. <laughs> I think that's, it's just, it's, that's what happens. I think a lot of people, but then when you, you're on social media, whatever the fans are like, oh, I'll fucking train it on my own, forget that X amount of money. But they all think about that kind of things rather than what it's doing to you mentally because they think that footballers or people, if you're in a spotlight, you're literally, a, you know, you don't have feelings or you're not a human, which is mm. obviously, you know, that's what they think. Well, how long did you say that you were feeling like, I just don't really want to be here? Probably about from the age of, I would say about, 27, 28 to, you know, 30, 31. I and think at no point did you think, I need to speak to somebody out of football? No, I, I just felt like I couldn't trust trust people because I did have um, counselling. I did go to counsellors and I'd speak to p certain people, but I just used to think, well, how the fuck can you tell me what to do when you're not playing in front of like thousands of people? How You don't know the pressure. You're just talking to me from a one-on-one -on -one basis from from there and it's only the time that I retired and I got on the phone to Sport and Chance and I said look I'm fucked I'm drinking this and that and, and I asked the guy I said are you an alcoholic and he said yeah and I said oh can you tell me some stuff back to, to see if I had anything kind of in relation to him and he was um, he started telling me some stories and it was exactly what I was like and it's only time that I could speak to a fellow alcoholic that I took that advice on board and I said look fucking get me in check me into rehab as soon as possible. Mm. And then they had a cancellation, otherwise I might have had to wait a, a couple of months or whatever. So they had a cancellation and um, yeah, I was fucked. I just need to get into rehab. And then when I got went to rehab, it was fuck, it was tough. It was tough as fuck. You know, we, we checked into rehab. There's three of us turned up. We we're supposed to be four. One guy tried slicing his throat the night before he, so he couldn't come into rehab. And that just kind of hit me thinking, fuck, I do need help because I want to be there for my children rather than be without a dad. How often were you drinking? I mean, when you finished? <clears throat> when I finished, I was drinking a lot, but then I could have like a week off the drink or two weeks. But then when I started back on it again, I didn't know when to stop. I was like, well, I can stop at one or two drinks. He was like, bosh. But when I was playing at Birmingham, I was having like three, four bottles of red wine the night, then going to train the next day. And then on the weekends, mm. it was through the roof. Was it more a case of the person you became when you had a drink? Yeah, evil prick. I was just like, and I was getting worse. I was getting angry and hated more and more and things and doing stupid things all the time. Obviously, you say you go out on a weekend and you, you're an absolute dick and that goes mm. on for three or four weeks. Yeah. And you carry on doing it. 
there's a problem yeah. there, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. If you think, oh, I was a, if you know, what I was an asshole is, last week. You I'm carry not, on doing it. Yeah. Like the amount of in look at today, uh, today's society when we were first went into lockdown. I think the alcohol fucking consumption or whatever it was of, of the supermarkets, the way they were selling the products, it went up like millions and millions of pounds. People behind closed doors, like locked in, think, fuck it, let's have a, the, the culture is, let's go and have a bevy. When we have a hard day at work, fuck it, let's crack a bottle of wine when we get home tonight, babe, and this and that, or whatever, finish work, you've been stressed, let's have a drink. Not like, what can we do mentally to help you better? Go for a ice cold bar, do meditation, go and exercise, go and do these things. Our instant thing is, let's get steaming or have a drink. Mm. Did it ever land you in bother? Oh yeah. Like I remember when I was at Birmingham, me and Clayton Donaldson, we were both injured at the same time and me and him were probably the closest of the lot there. We were, you know, very good friends. And um, we went on a fucking all day and we thought, we've seen a lot of Birmingham fans who were coming up, to, coming up to us saying, oh, can we have a fit picture of you? Can we get you a shot? We're like, fucking right, you can get us a shot. So we get, get, started having a few shots. And we thought we were being nice by having a few drinks with the fans, not being big time, not being an arsehole or whatever. We returned the favour, got them shots. And then a few of the fans who were having shots with us emailed the club the next day saying, why are these two fucking injured players getting steaming with us? <laughs> so well, that, was, yeah, so fucking hell, yeah. We had Jager bombs flying all over the gaff and we got in trouble for it. But apart from that, we, we had a few squabbles and on nights out on Christmas parties and fucking this and that. And But I remember a couple of my teammates, actually, they were the same when they had a few drinks. They were fucking lunatics. And when I started speaking about my drink and when I went into rehab, they messaged me and they, and they were saying, that's why we always had arguments because we were very similar, but there's no hate towards each other. We still have respect. And he was like saying, oh, you know, I felt down at that point. I lost so-and-so member of my family. I needed to drink and, and that's what it was. But at the time, no one knows what they're yeah. going through. Because when you start talking it, yeah. about it, you start every, everything else from other yeah. people start Because most people in well. the change room, they don't really give a fuck about you. Let's, let's be honest. They don't, they don't really like the amount of players you probably speak to when you retire, maybe two, three people. Like when you, think about it, you come across hundreds of players that you uh, share a changing room with and you don't speak to each other. You know, I think it, I might have had a ch uh, guy next to me who changed, had his locker next to me and I didn't even know what his fucking, his wife's name was, his children's name or nothing. He's just, just used to talk about bollocks, really. Just mad that people will be watching this and be thinking, that's me, that. Mm. You know, you, you're right about different types of alcoholics. Drink, you, know, you, know, you, don't, you didn't drink every day, but you still... Felt like you had a problem. Yeah. And that's, and there were times I would, I would drink every day. There would be times where I could have one or two weeks off and so on. Um, and it was funny because when I checked into rehab, I've never done any other drug other than alcohol. And they were like, oh, you're in here for drug and cocaine. And I was like, no, just uh, drink and cocaine. And I was like, no, just drink. And like, fuck me, you're the only footballer who's checked into rehab without doing cocaine. And I was like, what? I don't remember seeing any of my teammates doing cocaine or anything. And so I was like, saying, fuck me, I must be obliv oblivious to this. And um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite bizarre. And then when you start, when you're in rehab and you're putting all your flaws down of writing what bad things you did when you were drinking and so on and whatever else you can affect, it really hits home of, mm. of, of kind of like the shit that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's the best thing I ever did was going to rehab and just, you know, just speaking about my problems. And how long ago was that? So I'm, so I'll be, I'm over three years sober now. I'll be, well, I'm four years sober in uh, February. So it'd be like three and a half years ago, I checked into rehab. I've been sober ever since I left. I was, I stopped drinking just before I went into rehab. Um, because I knew I had to, I had to change it. I just had to stop. Otherwise it was that, it was do or die basically. It was, mm -hmm. again, it was no middle ground for me. There's still probably hardly no middle ground in my personality mm -hmm. now. I've got that addictive personality. And is there none of them thoughts that you were having before? You know what you're saying about going to car parks and whatever, would you say you're happy and yeah, I, I I think I manage things a lot better now. I know where to turn to if I have a problem. I don't have those thoughts of like wanting to die. Um, I have those feelings back of what my early days of being a professional footballer, I feel like like my energy is good and I don't give a fuck what anyone says about me or anything like that. I just think everyone's got their opinions. When I'm talking about the stuff that happens in the world of, you know, to do with COVID or whatever it might be, I get abused on a daily basis on social media. Couldn't give a flying fuck what I'm people noticed. say. Yeah, you've noticed. noticed yeah. <laughs> and so that was, I, I kind of feel I've got that kind of like self-belief back, if that makes sense. Yeah. And if, I ha if I'm having a bad day, I just think, fuck, it's a bad day. It's not a bad life. Just do the next best thing of like, you know, go and exercise, go and listen to music. If I feel like shit, I walk my dogs or... So you have those... You've coping mechanisms. Yeah, really, coping replace, mechanisms. Yeah, coping replace mechanisms. Replace the drinking with... Yeah. Those things, going and, out for a walk. Yeah. 
And I think that's that's the best thing. If I feel like like I still get stressed on a daily basis or every other day or in in the week I might feel like shit or whatever. But I then do I grind through it. I know that if I go for a walk, after that I feel like a million dollars. And that, I suppose it's the understanding as well. Like yeah, having that through, awareness. Going through of, rehab, yeah. rehab, you understand why you're feeling like that and what the solution is, rather than I'm feeling like this. Right, what do I do? Let's get let's get pissed yeah. and forget about it. Let's get pissed, yeah, because the problem is still going to be there the next day. Yeah. Even if you're going to fucking bender in Ibiza for a whole week, your problems are still going to be at home then when you arrive. Mm. So that's what I just have, as John said, I have those coping mechanisms now, what I can do to be better. I'm not perfect, still make loads of fucking mistakes, but I I know what I can do to be better mentally. Well done, mate. For, mm. Yeah, fair play. It's, I mean, you, you, you've... You made that call, which obviously was a very tough one. And like you said, three years. It's tough. Yeah. Here, because here, like, especially talk about it. it's tough because when I came out of rehab, I was staying with my parents for a little while and I used to get pissed off because my dad just drinks beers fucking everywhere. And, uh, I remember going to the bathroom. He has a nice, likes to have a pint and uh, in a bottle of beer when he's in the bath, just chilling. And he had a bottle of beer on the side and I was like going to brush my teeth or whatever and I'd say to my mum like fuck me I'm, I can't even I can't get away from it like I would expect if I'm staying with you for a little while because you were worried about me to kind of like stop drinking but you never stopped drinking and then when I'd speak to someone who's an alcoholic they'd be like he doesn't have to change like you need to protect yourself and then he protects himself you can only control what you can and that's yourself and that's when I kind of respected that thinking well he has he's been there through thick and thin. If he wants to have a beer, then he can do what he needs to do. Are you all right around people? When yeah. They're boozing and- I'm fine. Yeah. The only thing that I don't, I, I don't put myself in that situation all the time. If I meet a few friends, I just do different things now. And luckily the circle that I found now, we might go for a shisha or I, you know, I like having a cigar now and again or whatever, which is obviously not fucking healthy, but I need something. I can't be like a fucking yeah. boring bollocks. So I go for a shisha. I surround myself with different people. But when I'm around people, do you know what? I went to a, a club or a bar a couple of months back and I seen one guy there who used to go out all the time when I used to. I said, fuck me, are they super glued you to that floor? Because you're fucking sitting in the same spot, miserable as fuck. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, fuck, I love it. I love it, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, my life has materialized into something different. I, I don't miss that life anymore. And when you're speaking to people in the steam and I say to them, fuck me, you tell me that same story again. You've just told me seven times, you boring <laughs> bastard. Whereas like now I have genuine conversations with people who have the same interests as me or they're educating me about something rather than telling me, fuck me, do you want a shot? Let's get steaming or they're pissing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> now you're in a much better place. What, 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 are you, what are you up to now? And So I've got to do lots of work with my foundation with like mental health and addiction. We kind of support the local community. We're trying to, bigger and better that, um, to support people. We do a lot of work with the homeless, do a lot of education with the schools, um, in one school you busy all the time full. Yeah. Keep me busy. Kids, the dogs, all that kind of stuff. So it, yeah, my podcast I've got as well. And obviously coming on with great people like you guys, it just keeps me busy when I've been outspoken in terms of like the COVID stuff or whatever's going on in this fucking corrupt world. I've, my media work has slowed down, but yeah. I don't change my, um, principles just to get on a fucking TV show or whatever yeah any more crack from wales um yeah there's there's a, well there's been a few but there's there's one uh we were away with wales and we were, i think well, fucking, i can't remember where we were like croatia or something so we've all gone on a lads night out and where we used to go we'd have security guards come with us and we'd lock fucking buildings down and whatever else invite you know women in or whatever and um <laughs> what gigs you yeah? <laughs> I, <laughs> I remember the, i remember the one time because i was still young i was using the john toshak days and we jumped on the bus and uh one of the guys jumped on the coach and they didn't have their Welsh tracksuit on. Next thing you know, we see a bird walking across the road with a Welsh kappa tracksuit on. <laughs> Tosh actually turned around and goes, someone's had a fucking great night, haven't they, you players? <laughs> <laughs> so the lads were like, we were laughing at the back, chuckling. But we used to get up to fucking all sorts, you know, and uh, it was just class, really. And then when... And uh, obviously, you know, we'd go away and we just, we just get up to all sorts. You know, Chris Coleman jump on the guitar, we'd get steam and he'd just play songs to us. And we just had like a good fucking energy vibes about us. Was he good in? Yeah, he's class. He used to be class because he kind of had that, you could still see that he had that player's mentality. I think he was saying the one time when he used to have um, the football meetings with Bobby Gould, him and a couple of the other lads would fucking crawl across the floor and sneak out and go and get pissed. And Bobby Gould would still continue the meeting. He wouldn't know that anyone's left the fucking building. <laughs> and that's so, the end up being the manager. Yeah. And that's, 
and but he was he was amazing. He was like great with the lads. And do you know what? That's the only time that I've ever been on a bench of a football side, and my ego didn't take over to want to play. To obviously, I wanted to play, and I thought I should play on more occasions than I did. But I just I wanted my team to win. All the other times when I was on the bench, I was thinking, I hope you're fucking losing. And then when I come on, we kind of turn the result around because you you want to do well for yourself. Um, but he just had that energy and he brought everyone together to kind of like think, fuck it, we're all this, all this in as a group. And obviously we had Bale, one of the best players in the world at the time. And we just felt fucking indestructible, really. What are you like off the pitch? Yeah, I would write the exact same question. <laughs> Do you know what? He's oh, fucking practicing his swing he's, at, um, just at dinner. Oh, he's practicing his swing, yeah. But he's, and he, he used to make me fucking chuckle because when he used to bring his um, Spanish masseur, masseuse over from Real Madrid, they'd be speaking Spanish together in the media, like, can't speak Spanish, haven't fucking learned the language, whatever. But he was speaking Spanish and just taking the piss, really. He probably just thought, fuck him, he didn't yeah. care about the media. Do you know what? He used to do childish things all the time. We'd be on the plane, he'd be throwing Harry, Bo Harry Bows at people and he'd turn his back and make funny noises. But I think <laughs> that kind of like, it's childish, you think probably, fuck me, you grown man, you're doing that, like, come what on. What kind of noise? But I, you go, <laughs> like all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but like, he, he's a bugger, know, isn't he? Do you know what? He's a bugger, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what though? I think that's what kind of, in a strange way, I think that's what kind of made him more grounded. Cause you think, fuck me, you're on X amount of money a week. One of the biggest superstars on the planet right now, and you're throwing Harry Bows at people and looking away. I just, I think that kind of made him a little <laughs> yeah, bit more grounded. I like yeah, it. yeah. You know, I clearly, like I'm it. Play fucking hell. Bale's been on again. <laughs> I know, yeah. Sweeping the sweeping the <laughs> tactics yeah, up. Yeah, I know. Fucking hell, <laughs> But yeah, it was it was class. I loved it. We just um, it was just like amazing stories. Really, we just fucking did what we we just did what we wanted as and when we had a manager who supported us used to get a fucking night out didn't want to take us back home too early because he knew we'd go on the piss it's brilliant who's, who's been your favourite manager probably Gary Wright is my favourite manager just because he knew how to, I felt like he knew how to look after me he treated me like a human being yeah. Chris Coleman treated every player like a human being as well in terms of the training preparation Brendan Rodgers is the best um but we obviously, he didn't, he made me train on my own or train with the kids and stuff, which is obviously, I think, if you do that in a normal working society, oh, by the way, you haven't stacked the shelves properly in Tesco's, but you're working in aisle, aisle 12 on your own all fucking day and seeing no other humans. It's not right, is it? But yeah. it's kind of like normal in the fo w football world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you do. It's the noise, isn't it? Noise, yeah. Bounce off people's head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, the, like making cow noises and stuff like that and cow noises cow noises do you know what when we were fucking when we were in, uh, away at the Euros we used to get together and the, the losing team would have to do something in the evenings and we'd have to get fucking you know people would come out they would do the hacker in like their just pants and stuff to have to do the dance just all fucking mad stuff like that but when I, re I released the one time on fucking social media, <laughs> fucking when the wives and girlfriends rung that player, raging about it. I just thought, why? It's just a bit of banter. It's like fucking, it shows people that you're normal. You're only doing a fucking yeah. hacker. <laughs> when, when he was chucking the Arribos, was it just the, the team, the squad, or was it members of the public? It'd be, no, no, no. It'd be um, just us on the plane. And then Wait, even, if it, even if it is squad, I think, it, you know, if you're a new player coming in, oh, yeah, be and you get the Arribo and you hear the... Ah! The, and you turn around, the last person you're going to think it is is Gareth Bale. You're not, you're not going to think it's him, are you, really? Because you think, well, fuck me. Why are you doing that? Or, and you do the old school band of like tapping on the shoulder, look away, and it's just like, fuck you, I think, come on. <laughs> you're Gareth Bale. You're just being yeah. with fucking Ronnie, come on. <laughs> oh, dear. Like he's, like he's gone up for yeah. me. He's I like gone up. No, but, but, I don't, you... but I do not, to be fair, I don't like the wasting of food. No. <laughs> So uh, it's you know what? That's what player, fucking please. he would. I used to look at him, and he was unbelievable player. And do you know what I loved about him is the fact that he was like a team player. He would get the best out of. So if we had meetings with the FAW, he wasn't always about his image rights or money for himself. He'd be like, "What can we do as a squad collectively?" So because he knew he had that voice, and he was fucking big into that. I think before the Euros, we were talking about our bonuses, and if they weren't right, we were going to literally fucking you know, hold them ransom basically to kind of like ransom to kind of like make sure they looked after us because before we were like by far the least paid players. I know, you should, I know you're playing for your country and stuff, but we've done so much. We felt like we need to be rewarded as well. And he was just like saying, look, if you don't look after the players, then 
you know, obviously it's not great. And he he, he was a voice for that. And that's that's how players um, respected him. Because I that's think good, uh, previous years... Does, does help if you're on fucking 500 grand a week, <laughs> right? <don't laughs> it? Yeah. I don't want all that money. Give some other lads in. <laughs> yeah, give, so, and I think he gave all his money to charity when we had like the European bonus. But he, that's what I like. Oh, that makes you look bad, though, yeah. doesn't it? But, well, <laughs> fucking... <laughs> just, we're not on 600 grand a week, just basic wages, the rest of it. But we need... But we give this to charity. Anybody yeah. else? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, fucking no charity. <laughs> 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 was like fucking hell <laughs> but yeah he, he, no he's 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 a wicked person like really grounded but he wanted the best for the lads loves Wales he's, he's class it was the noise again Chris eh? <laughs> <laughs> every time I see him now I, I, anybody who listen to it if they ever play golf with him just on his backswing yeah <laughs> 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 class really weird. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, mate. thank you very much, yeah. mate. Good luck with it all. Yeah, yeah, all, no all worries. Best, best, best of luck with everything going forward. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. What was that stretch, saucer? So, <laughs> I, 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 I shaved. Wait a minute. I, I, I shaved like my shot. Shot. Oh, I know. Please Suck no. It. I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think fucking Paulo Souza had more hair on his balls than I've got on my body. 